Hey everybody, it's Romania Black, and we are on Volume 5 of Heaven Officials Blessing! And it just occurred to me today, this is part 52 of my readings, meaning I have been reading Heaven Officials Blessing every week for a year. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that wild? And I've been with Heaven Officials Blessing even longer than that because this was, I started reading after I finished season one of the Donghua. So I find it very, very coincidental that I'm on week 52 of reading Heaven Officials Blessing. And right now, the chapter of the Manhua I'm about to talk about deals with where I started reading at. Like, I did read, I did read Volume 1, but I had already seen the events of Volume 1, so technically, the first place I picked up at was around this part here. So, isn't that crazy? We're going back in the Manhua to where I really started getting into Heaven Official's Blessing past the Donghua. It's kind of insane. <laughs> So we're going to look at chapter 92 of the Manual today because that came out today and I looked at it and was like, oh no, we're going to incorporate it into our readings today. And then we're going to be looking at chapters 163 through 166. As of right now, I only have this week and the next two weeks of volume five. We only have three weeks total, this week and the next two of volume five. And then we're going to be moving into volume six. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. I was like, oh, wait, I want to hold on to this volume a little bit longer. We've, we've spent so much time with it. I'm not ready to move into volume six. What? What? No. But we have to. Got to keep checking. The good news is volume seven is going to come out sometime in September, which if I do the math correctly, I will have plenty of time with volume six by the time volume seven gets here. So that'll be great. And then volume eight is coming out in November. Like they're just chucking in these volumes, getting them in there. So, I mean, I think it'll be definitely the beginning of next year before I get to volume eight or finish it. But that's crazy. Like we're going to have, we're going to have Heaven Officials Blessing into 2024, but then we're going to be caught up. It just, it suddenly hit me today. I was like, oh wow. When we start volume six, volume six is the shortest volume out of all of them. And I went to the discord. I'm like, I don't know what to feel about that. And everybody was like, ha, ha, ha. and I was like, <laughs> So whatever that means, who knows, but I, I do have some comments before we dive into part 52 into chapters 163 and 166. Uh, the last set getting everything with Yin Yu, Yin Yu and Chi Ying broke my heart. It made me just feel so sad for the two of them and their circumstances. And I just, I want the best for them. <laughs> but we ended up the chapter with the Goshi of Shanla making a special appearance on the other side of the wall and saying that Shelian's a lost cause. And I'm like, well, why are we tossing him to the wolves now? Who are you talking to? Like just so much mystery, so much mystery y'all. But let's dive into these comments and then we'll talk about the manhwa and then we'll start the chapters. So sorry if this intro is a little bit long. A uh, little Gigi points out that MXTX uh, may have meant something different when they were talking about digging up through the bottom with the mountain spirits in chapters 155 to 158. And I'm like, I just got my mind out of the gutter <laughs> and you throw me right back in like a bowling ball. So <laughs> MXDX, why? Why are we doing this? I don't want to think of the mountain spirits that way. I just got done with Bishin. With Bishin, why do I want to do that? Uh, Millipop said that the inside of the mountain spirit, speaking of which, uh, is a lot like a bouncy castle. <laughs> a bouncy castle. And I'm like, that's just a really fun, cutesy way of saying, uh, of going through all these horror elements. But also there were several people that talked about, uh, Millipop included, that Pei Ming has this like childlike energy to him. He does. He's kind of like Qiing. He has a very youthfulness to him, which, I mean, Pei Ming does a lot to keep youthful, y'all. <laughs> Um, SQQLBH had a lot of really, uh, 314 had a lot of really good comments. One was the idea about Yin Yu having a really good handle, <laughs> pun intended, ba -da -ba, on the Earth Master Shovel, whereas Heshan did not. And I don't know if that's because Yin Yu is like a, a, a heavenly official of a land territory and Heshan is the black water and, you know, water handling land is a little bit, it always ends up as mud, so it just doesn't work out, right? I don't know if there's something to that, but I thought that was really interesting. Showing Yin Yu is very competent, very competent, very plain looking. 
but very competent. Uh, someone shared an image of Yin Yu in the Waning Moon Officer attire from the Manhua in the last volume. And I was like, he's kind of short. And they're like, oh, wow, he kind of is. And I was like, oh, no, he's plain, he's short. Poor Yin Yu. I feel for him. Um, also, SQQLBH talked about how it does take a lot of courage, though, because Yin Yu is in the same boat as Pei Su and Shi Lian. Now, Shi Lian's borrowing some power from Heshan, uh, from Hua Chong, not Heshan. Shi Lian's borrowing some power from Hua Chong, and Pei Su has kind of, you know, like not been put in any immediate danger. But Yin Yu's kind of in the same boat as them. He has been shackled. He doesn't have. I don't know if Pei Su has been shackled too. I assume he has. But he's been shackled, his spiritual powers are cut off, and he's just really strong. Shilian's really, really strong, but they're just relying on their physical strength at this point. So it takes a lot of courage to go into Mount Tonglu, especially because, I mean, other than Chi Ying, Yin Yu doesn't have any reason to. I mean, Hua Chong is coming with Shilian for reasons. Pei Su is coming because of the Rainmaster. And Yin Yu is coming because of Chi Ying. So I guess there's a reason for them to be there. But yeah, it's pretty courageous of him. And I also like the idea that Yin Yu seems to be the only one, the only heavenly official other than Shi Lian that Hua Chong is on good terms with. Because I mean, yeah, if he's been helping Hua Chong for years and years and years, and not, and it's not like a Heshan situation where Heshan's been up in the heavenly realm and away from Hua Chong, Yin Yu's been like right there with Hua Chong. So I, there's been a lot of fan art shared in the Discord of of Hua Chong just like kind of like airing his grievances to Heshan and Heshan's like oh my god quit talking about Shi Lian but now I'm like Yin Yu's also been there the whole time so there's been a couple from season two the Donghua preview where we see that preview of the camera panning up to Hua Chong and like all the wind blowing his face and there's been a lot of fan art where it's Yin Yu like blowing the fan like is he coming sir <laughs> he will be but yes that's that was really funny and then SQQLBH noted that there are the three negative mental states, greed, hatred, and ignorance, have been talked about previously as the three poisons, referenced as Zhang Chong's sword in Modao Zushi. So I like that MXTX is bringing some things back, kind of taking some things from Modao Zushi and putting it in a heaven official's blessing. That's really nice. Um, and then finally, Anime Annie talks about the butterflies are literally Hua Chong's Swiss army knife, which yes, they can literally do everything. You want something to be efficient in your kitchen, you get yourself some silver butterflies, right? I mean, there's a chance that could hurt you, but I mean, as long as you're Sheila and you're fine. <laughs> and then yes, Pei Ming having the childish energy. And I like the idea though, that Anime Annie talked about how Pei Ming, he leaves behind his past and is only focusing on future matters. Whereas like a heavenly official like Lan Chan Chu, struggles to leave behind that past. They're still clinging to their former realm, to Yongin. So I thought that was really interesting. But yeah, really good comments there. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, the manual before we start in this. I know it's a long intro, but you all are used to this. So chapter 92, there's a lot of good artwork in this chapter. I really like, we were talking about it in the Discord with ch with the last chapter from last week, but how like, like, um, Mooching's hair, his bangs look so good. They're so floofy. Like his hair looks really, really well done here. Uh, Function looks exactly like you'd picture him looking. And everybody is just like, I, I forget the idea that Mooching and Function were not around Shilian when he was the Goshi of Function. So they're probably like, wait, you were a Goshi, Shilian? When did this happen? Why were you a Goshi? Did you know what you were doing? <laughs> and it's like, well, apparently not. Because, you know, massacres happened. I also like... Um, how Jun Wu is drawn, like this image of Shi Lian. Jun Wu is just like got his hands on his hip in the ultimate domineering pose, like just surveying the entire Grand Marshal Hall like you do. Just like, what am I going to do with these kids? That's literally the energy he's giving off. But I love the Windmaster. The way the Windmaster is drawn by Star Ember is so beautiful. I love that Shi Lian looks so innocent and ethereal. But the Windmaster with those like mint green eyes and like that match the mint green accents on their outfit and the headpiece, it's just, and the whisk, the jade whisk, ah, oh, it's just, it's absolutely gorgeous. And then Windmaster sticking up for Shilian saying, well, if Shilian really wanted to kill Lan Chan Chu, he would have already done it. And I like that we get that little flashback of, of Hua Chong versus them. And Hua Chong's face in that flashback is like, Oh my god, I nearly hurt Gege. Like, just like, he's just, you know he's sitting right now in the burnt remnants of Paradise Manor going, I nearly hurt Gege, Yiming, what am I gonna do? Like, he's gonna hate me! <laughs> it's like, 
I love all the fan art that talks about Hesha about Hua Chong just freaking out, and usually Heshan's in the background like. <sighs> but now we can add Yin Yu in there, so that's fun. I do like. I want to make note. There is this shot of everybody around Mu Ching and Feng Shen just like making small talk and comments. And of course, Mu Ching and Feng Shen are like the most detailed characters there. But the guy right beside uh, Feng Shen looks like Yao from Modao Zushi. I was like, is that a cameo? Did Star Ember do an intentional cameo of Yao? Because that's absolutely hilarious if it's true. I, I thought that was really, really funny, right? Also, the hand of Jun Wu, like I know it's just a hand reaching forward, but he's got like the daddy ring and he's like, it's just, it's so ethereal. And I love the way that, that, that Lon Chan Chu is drawn there, he looks so young and like juvenile in that image. It also looks like he's been crying, but like the mascara's like ran under his eyes, making him have like raccoon eyes. He just looks so young and impressionable there. And Jun Wu's like, you are reckless, Lon Chan Chu. You need to learn to use your judgment and don't just barrel through everything. Imagine that, right? Imagine that. And then you see Lon Chan Chu being like, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So, so that's the situation. And so they talk about him restricting him to his palace. What's interesting about this entire scene here is that the Manwa chapter doesn't show us the conversation between Xilian and Jun Wu afterwards. We don't get that conversation. I don't remember. It, it definitely happens, right? There's a conversation that Jun Wu has with Xilian about Hua Chong and being careful not to trust him. There's that conversation that happens and then he sends him to his palace. It's not in the Manwa chapter and that's not unusual for Star Ember. Sometimes Star Ember likes to skip things that they don't deem are necessary to draw <laughs> in the Manwa. That's why I'm glad I'm not just looking at the Manwa. I'm looking at the other stories first because the Manwa picks and chooses what it decides to leave out and it moves stuff around sometimes. So there may be a situation where Shilian like flashes back to having that conversation with Jun Wu after they all leave and Star Ember's just waiting to draw it then. I don't remember. Volume 2 was a long time ago. <laughs> but I do love the way that Pei Ming is drawn. I like that Pei Ming has like the royal blue with the red accents. It's very nice. He's very handsome with his beautiful bangs and his big ponytail. And he's so petty here. He has that little petty thing like, ah, oh, Pei Jr. just wasn't as lucky. And I love the Windmaster's little chibi face being like, hey, quit misconstruing things, Pei Ming. Like, Junior Pei was totally different. Like, I just love the Windmaster whisk, like, whipping the whisk around as they chase after, as they chase after Pei Ming. It's really cute. I love it. And then uh, we have Lon Chan Chu going up and grabbing the swords and giving Xilian a look and his, like, tiger orange eyes. Mm-hmm. I love that Star Ember, even though they make them all look pretty, they all have very distinguishing features. And Lon Chan Chu's hair is like really spiky in a lot of places, like a, like a tiger, right? I love it. I just absolutely love the way that they're drawn here. So yeah, so then we go back to, uh, we skip the whole thing with, with Jun Wu telling Shi Lian about how it's dangerous to work with Hua Chong. I'm sorry, my dogs are barking. Why are you guys doing that? <laughs> But I love that Shilian, they're just chasing each other in circles at this point. Yep, there they go. <laughs> but I love that Shilian's sitting at his desk, like, waiting what to do. He has the ultimate, like, like um, baby girl pose. He's just like, I wish someone would come and whisk me away from this place. <laughs> like, that's what Shilian's face looks like. He's like, I just wish my Prince Charming would come. And at the end of this chapter, lo and behold, right? What a tease. What a tease. But that expression by Shilian is just like, <sighs> I just, I love it so much. But yeah, so then we have Shilian wondering if he should have to pay Hua Chong back for the die, for the Paradise Manor burning. And I love that he's just sitting there like wistfully thinking about it. But as he's thinking about it, his hands are on the dice. Like, like his hands are on the dice. And it's just like he's thinking about Hua Chong as he's doing it. It could be something, you know, deemed a little bit sexual if it was anybody else but Shilian, but because it's Shilian, it's the most innocent thing ever. And then we have him being like, I, if I'm demoted again, I'll pay him back even if I have to sell scraps. And I'm like, oh honey, oh honey, one, Hua Chong is not attached to the Paradise Manor at all. And two, he's not gonna let you work. <laughs> Baby girl, no. 
It's like, I like it says, it's just a matter of whether it'll take tens or hundreds of years. I'm like, it ain't gonna take you no time. <laughs> and so he clicks it on his snake eyes, right? Which I'm like, that is that the signal of Hua Chong coming? And then we have, I totally forgot that Mu Ching and Feng Shen show up fighting each other, right? And Feng Shen is blaming Mu Ching for causing a stir in the in the grand hall, being like, you just wanted information about Shi Lian. I'm sure you want him to be ruthless and cruel. Who knows? Do you know? Do you think no one knows about your little plan? So yeah, I forgot about this part, right? At this part of the story, uh, Nan Fang believes that Mu Ching is trying to set Shi Lian up as being someone that's working with Hua Chong and doing wrong, kind of like what Pei Ming was doing, right? And Nan Fang hates it. But and that's why he's beating him up. But Shi Lian never really gets mad at Mu Ching or blames him or thinks he's doing anything nefarious. This is literally just Nan Fang's agenda against Mu Ching and what he thinks he's doing. And Mu Ching says, the only difference between us is luck. Do you have the right to look down on me? And I feel like that's always been Mu Ching's kind of thing in this story from what we've seen of him. He always gets a little bit frustrated because just because of where he was born and his circumstance, he believes that people look down on him. And Shi Lian doesn't, but others might. I mean, from what we've seen from this story so far, it is not unheard of for people in the heavenly realm to be a little bit snooty, especially if you didn't come from like some kind of luxurious or legacy family. And then the end of the chapter shows Shi Lian showing up being like, oh, stop, I'll call someone over if you keep fighting. And that's when the butterflies come in. Oh, I hate that we have to wait two weeks before the next chapter when Hua Chong comes to rescue Shi Lian. I hate that. Boo. But I'm really excited. I'm really excited to get into seeing Chi Rong. I have waited so long now to see Chi Rong in Star Ember's form, as you all have, so I'm so excited. But yeah, I really liked this chapter of the Manhua. It was a lot of fun. It was great. Um, but I'm really excited to finally, it's nearly been 20 minutes, <laughs> get into chapters 163 through 166 but i i'm excited y'all i don't know what to expect with this goshi knowing mxtx they're gonna give us nothing they're gonna give us nothing and make it a big old tease and make us wait but what else is new <laughs> So we're going to find out, though. We're going to check out chapters 163 to 166 of Heaven Officials Blessing. And we're going to do that here in three, two, one. And let's do this. Chapter 163, Riddle of the Mysterious Goshi, Confounding Minds. What? Shilian's heart started racing wildly and even his fingertips were slightly trembling. However, he remained composed and didn't make a sound, only lifting his head a little to whisper next to Hua Chong's ear. San Long, don't move. The voice out there sounds a lot like my master. Let's not be discovered. Although very similar, he couldn't say for sure either, since it wasn't like there weren't people who shared similar voices. Fair enough! Besides, he hadn't seen the Goshi for centuries, so he could very well have remembered wrong. Fair enough! If they didn't make any reckless moves and only observed quietly to see how things progressed, perhaps they would learn more secrets. Hua Chong also bowed his head slightly, hugging his waist. All right, you don't move either. Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah, he's like, okay, I'll stay here with you, no problem. Rocks and earth crushed at them from all around, forcing their bodies to press tightly against one another, their faces brushing, their ears warm. Although it wasn't the right time, a thought flashed through Xi Lian's mind. To die buried together doesn't feel so bad. Oh my gosh! Just, is now the time? Just then that voice sounded again. What about the other two? Where have they run off to? The other two? There were two more companions? Shilin wanted to listen closely to find out just who the other person conversing was. But the strange thing was, after the Goshi, he would answer him as Goshi for now. After for now, after he posed the question, there wasn't any response. It really was strange. At such a distance, Shilin and Hua Chong could hear, could both hear Goshi's questions. Goshi's questions. His voice wasn't too loud, and he wasn't yelling at the top of his lungs. So the other party shouldn't be too far away. If they should respond, then at least some voice should be heard. Yet there was really nothing to be heard. Goshi spoke up again. 
thank them for their efforts, but there's no need to worry about the small fries anymore. Nothing will come of them. We've got more important, important things to do right now. What is going on? Shilian wondered internally. This clearly shows he's gotten a response and is talking to someone. The Goshi outside was almost like he was talking to himself or having a conversation with the air. Is it the communication array? A creepy image appeared in Shilian's head and he immediately brushed it off, thinking there might be another possibility, which was that the Goshi could hear the person's voice, but no one else could. Suspicion was growing thicker and thicker in his head, and he listened with more and more intensity, turning over each word the Goshi uttered in his mind. Goshi added, added, is that all the people inside the mountain? In any case, let's bring them all to the kiln first. I'll think of a way to take care of them one by one then. The faster the better. They must get there within two days. The kiln! And within two days, the distance shortening array couldn't be used within Mount Tonglu. So how could they get there in two days? And what was this take care of them? After a pause, that voice continued. Call the other two over. Let's go to the kiln together. In order to face his highness, the crown prince, not a single one of us should be missing. Right now, he's still not yet awakened. If he should wake, it's hard to imagine what he will do this time. Shilian was shocked. Was he talking about him? Right then, there were sounds of explosions within the mountain body. Shilian heard the Goshi outside question, What's going on? Inside the stone wall, he also turned to ask Hua Chong, What's going on? Something's happened on the other side, Hua Chong whispered. Shilian hadn't res yet responded, and Hua Chong had already pressed his forehead to his own. In Shilian's right eye, the situation with Yin Yu and Chan Yijin on the other side of the cave appeared once more. And this should be what happened a little earlier. Yin Yu finally dug out Chan Yijin from the stone wall, laboriously drugged him, dragged him down, and heaved a sigh. Yet unexpectedly, the unconscious Chan Yijin suddenly left his feet and pulled the mask off of Yin Yu's face. Chan Yijin had only pretended to have fainted earlier. Oh my god! Now that Shilian thought about it, Chan Yijin would be extremely familiar with Yin Yu's habit of pacing when thinking, the way he spoke, his strength when he hit. Perhaps the moment Yin Yu's shovel was swinging down his way, he already knew who was behind the mask. It was just that it was inconceivable there'd come a day when someone like Chan Yijin would know how to use deception. Although it was nothing more than a, the most ordinary of tricks. When it was Chan Yijin who used it, it could be considered completely out of this world, which is why no one was prepared. Underneath the mask was the terrified and dimly pale face of Yin Yu, obviously stunned and surprised. Chan Yijin, however, was fiercely thrilled, jumping with his head covered in blood. Oh, Shi Zhong! Yin Yu looked like he saw something extremely horrifying. His lips twisting, then abruptly he hugged his head. You've got the wrong person! Having roared, he bolted. As he ran, he blasted at the person behind him to block him. Don't come near me! Don't follow me! Chan Yijin dashed after him, completely ignoring the blast. He only yelled, Shi Zhong, it's me! Yin Yu couldn't help but roar out an explosive, Oh, God damn it! it's because it's you that I'm terrified! Don't follow me! The two ran and fought the entire way, causing the mountain to rumble from the blasts. Over on this side, the Goshi was puzzled. What are they doing over there? What's with all that noise? There was still no one who answered him, but the Goshi seemed to have gotten a response. I see. Kids these days, so energetic. I'll take my leave first. Let's get together again once you've got close to the kiln. He was going to leave. Hearing this, Hua Chong covered Shilian's ears anew, and Shilian closed his eyes. A moment later, there was a violent tremor from all around, and the stone wall that had been pushing against their bodies was finally blown apart. The two left out together, landing light on their feet, and they breathed fresh air once more. However, on the outside was an empty cave. There was no Goshi, nor that mysterious second person. Their figures completely gone. Shi Lian and Hua Chong exchanged a look. They weren't in a hurry to give chase, and they hadn't yet moved, when from the cave adjacent to them came a charging black-clad man. It was Yin Yu! He waved the Earthmaster shovel and dashed madly towards the two. Chong Zhu, your highness! Behind him, Chong Yijin, whose head was covered in blood from the blows, also came rushing in. Hua Chong didn't bother looking up and only flicked his hand. There was a boom sound, and Chong Yijin instantly raised both arms to block, and yet the move Hua Chong used couldn't be blocked by fists. After the smoke dispersed, what was left where Chan Yijin stood was only a Daruma doll with big wide eyes looking very innocent. It was the same trick that Hua Chong used on Lan Chan Chu last time. Only then did Yin Yu stop in his crazed run, wiping his sweat away as he approached. I'm eternally grateful, Chan Zhu. 
Did you really have to be so scared? Hua Chong asked. Yin Yu was still shaken and he smiled bitterly. Truth be told, right now, when I see His Highness Qi Ying, I only want to run away as far as possible. When Qi Lian heard, he found it funny, but could sympathize. It seemed Chan Yijin's personality was now a severe shadow in Yin Yu's heart. The Daruma doll was still on the ground, wide-eyed as it swayed heavily back and forth without anyone caring. Shilian felt pity for it and was about to pick it up when he suddenly felt the ground shake, his body also falling over along with the tremors, almost shaking harder than the Daruma doll. What's going on? An earthquake? Although he didn't need help, Hua Chong still held his arm to help him steady and he turned to Yin Yu. Open a tunnel and go out and take a look. Yes, sir! Yin Yu recovered extremely fast. He picked up the Earthmaster shovel and rapidly and concisely dug out a hole in a small amount of time. Sunlight from the outside shone through. When Yin Yu took a look, surprise filled his face. Your Highness Yin Yu, is it an earthquake or there's a mountain collapsing? It's neither. The mountain spirit is running. Running? Shi Lian and Hua Chong exchanged a look and they ran up outside to take a look at the mountain spirit. It really was running. Outside the body of the mountain, all the scenery, all the landscapes were rapidly speeding behind them, almost reduced to nothing but colorful streaks. It was like they were running, riding a fast-running horse carriage, or like they were sitting on the shoulders of a giant running wild. Hills, rivers, fields, forests, they were all trampled beneath the feet of this mountain spirit, crushed to make way. Whooshing whirlwinds blew in from the hole, and the hair and ribbon bands started dancing in the air. Yin Yu remarked, by the speed of this run, it'll probably take only two days to reach the kiln. <gasps> Two days, it dawned on Shi Lian. No wonder, no wonder they couldn't hear the responding voice of the other person. And no wonder the Goshi requested for the other to bring them to the kiln within two days. Because at the time, Goshi wasn't talking to another person. He was talking to the mountain spirit. Oh, okay. Just as well. Borrowing its strength, we won't need to walk so slowly anymore. Once we're there, that person outside the stone wall will show himself again. We'll know what he wants then. But Shilian was looking somber, and Hua Chong noticed, Gege, what's wrong? What did he mean, not yet awakened? Shilian asked. The voice said earlier, right now he's not yet awakened. If he should wait, it's hard to imagine what he will do this time. Shilian said, if that man really was my master and he was talking about me, what did he mean by all that? Gege, don't think too much right now, Hua Chong said. First, that man might not be your master. And second... The crown prince he spoke of might not be you. It might be, oh my God, it, it could be Bai Wusheng. It could be him. Oh my God, okay. Okay, but what if it was, Shilian urged. I have some baseless guesses. Will you hear me out and see if they make sense? Very well, Gigi, do tell. Theorize with us, Shilian. Throw it out there. Throw it out there, Shilian. Shilian started, well, assuming that that man is my master, the three mountains, old age, sickness, and death, have birth missing. He can communicate with the mountain spirits. He's a person, but the one conversing with him is a mountain spirit. In their conversation, they meant the other two. So he might mean the other two mountain spirits. There are four of them. I was thinking, do the three mountain spirits all possess human consciousness? Or perhaps they were transformed from people in the beginning. The Goshi was the birth who never appeared. Yes, that's what we're talking about. Okay, yay. Yay, Shilian, come on. His heart was beating rapidly as he continued. Yes. Mount Tonglu used to be part of the kingdom of Wuyang. Birth, old age, sickness, and death. There are a set of four. Coincidentally, the crown prince of Wuyang also had four guardian deputies. Oh my god, we're on the same page, Shilian! There are also four Goshi who taught me when I grew up in Shanla. Do countries typically have that many Goshi? I didn't think anything of it in the past, but now I realize there's normally not that many. Do you think that that's a coincidence or is there a deeper meaning? Oh, Hua Chong replied, there is no deeper meaning. So maybe it just so happens there's four. Aren't the four famous sites also four? Weren't there four calamities? So one just had to be forced into its ranks. However, Xi Lian was still following his train of thought. But if that's true, that my four masters were the four guardian deputies of the crown prince of Wuyang, why did they come to Shanla to become the Goshi of Shanla? Why did they come to teach me? Is there something about me that myself that I'm not aware of? Could it be that I'm actually... He was going off like someone possessed. And watch on gripped his shoulder, speaking with conviction. It's not possible. I can swear you are you. You are not anyone else. 
Trust me, do not read too much into things and imagine what's not there. Other than his parents, Goshi was someone Shi Lian was the closest and most familiar with. Although Goshi often dismissed him and was often reserved because, of the w and because he was wary of Shi Lian's position, overall he was a good teacher. To suddenly discover he might not know someone he thought he was familiar with was something that easily confounded his heart. Hua Chong softened his voice. All right, Gege, think back carefully. What was the Goshi of Shanla's background? I'm not sure. He actually couldn't remember where his master came from. So, okay, does he think... That is, is Shilian worried that he's like a reincarnation of, of the Prince of Wuyang? Or we'll talk about this in discussion. If the Goshis all think that he could possibly be like the second coming of the, the Crown Prince of Wuyang. If he's like a reincarnated version of him. Hmm. Humming for a moment, Shilian said, Goshi was Goshi before I was born. I only know that he was called Mei, Mei Nyongqing. Mei Nyongqing. But needless to say, that must have been a fake name. I've also thought that this before in the past. Goshi is such an incredible character. How come he didn't ascend? If that was him just now, then the years he spent in this world must be many more than me. We'll take care of things as they come, Hua Chong said. Remember that if anything should happen, I'm here. I will always be by your side and on your side. Shilian stared at him, stunned and speechless. A moment later, a small smile appeared on his face. Yin Yu's sense of presence was already faint, and since he didn't speak the whole time, he was practically forgotten. Only now did he speak up. Uh, Changju, do we need to go find the others? I thought he's been standing there the whole time! They'd come out, but who knows which corner Pei Ming and the others were being digested by the mountain spirit after they'd been swallowed. Shilin replied quickly, yes, let's go find them together. Please wait, Your Highness Yin Yu. Your Highness, there's no need to call me Your Highness. I'm not a heavenly official of the upper court anymore. Then you can just call me by my, my, by my name, too. No need to be so polite. I also haven't been a crown prince in a long time. Yin Yu glanced at Hua Chong standing behind Shili and replies hastily, I, I, I daren't. I shouldn't. I, I can't. <laughs> well, what's the concern? Shili and said. He took a couple steps out, ready to pick up Yan Chi and the Daruma doll, when a figure suddenly dropped from the sky and fell heavily before him. The sounds of bone cracking loud and crisp in the air. What? I mean, he's not calling Shili and Shili because Hua Chong's like, don't you dare. But Shili and I are like on wavelengths together. We're connecting the dots. Yes. Shilian, I love you. All right, next chapter. <laughs> chapter 164. Oh, this is four chapters too. What am I thinking? I'm an idiot. <laughs> the riddle of the mysterious Goshi confounding minds too. Shilian's first reaction was to reach for Fang Shen and strike. Good thing he had good habits. Before he struck, he swept a glance and forced himself to break mid-action. General Pei! It was General Pei. He dusted off his shoulders, looking amazingly at ease, and glanced at them. Looks like your highness and my lord the ghost king are enjoying yourselves here! <laughs> not too bad, not too bad, Shilian said. But General Pei, are you all right? You, I heard a cracking sound. Oh, it's nothing. The cracking sound wasn't my bones, but the bones of this one. He raised an object, and it was the femur of the unlucky man. Okay. Well, thank goodness for this good brother's help that this Pei Ming was able to dig out an escape route from the mountain's body spirit. Even though it's the bone of a man, it's still a fairly solid good man. Just as he finished, from not far away, a second figure dropped from the sky, falling down on landing heavily. The group of them walked over to see, and this time it was Pei Su. In the curve of his arms was Banyu being shielded. Oh, what a gentleman! And Banyu's arms were holding those two black clay pots that contained Kamo and Rongguang. The two of them were ashen-faced and disheveled, but there didn't seem to be anything serious, and they quickly crawled up. Pei Sung spat out a mouthful of dust. A general, your highness. <laughs> it's still messed up. Looked like looks like this mountain spirit didn't doesn't think we're tasty enough and spat us out. Pei Ming glanced up. Hua Chang and Shilin exchanged a look. And not necessarily. Perhaps someone told it to spat you out. Pei Ming took a few steps and noticed the abnormal ground shaking, and he furrowed his brows. What's with this mountain? Why is it shaking so hard? Because it's currently carrying us and running towards the kiln, Shilian replied. Pei Ming walked to the hole Yin Yu dug and looked outside. So fast! Well, that'll save us some footwork! But there was still another person missing. Where's Ling Wen? 
Hua Chong seemed to have used his right eye to take a look and replied, the silver butterfly resting on his back was swallowed by the mountain spirit. He's gone. Meaning, Ling Wen and the brocade immortal can now move as they willed. That was no joke. Well, we need to go find him! And the group that had started running about the body of the mountain spirit, Hua Chong released another few hundred ray, hundred wraith butterflies to conduct the search. And in the end, it led them to another hole. The hole was forcibly blown out, its edges jagged, and was beyond it was the scenery of landscapes rapidly flying by. Wishing wild winds poured straight into the mountain body, making howling cries like those of demons. After Ling Wen was spat out by the mountain spirit, he probably blew the hole himself and ran away. Shelian looked down from the edges of the hole and frowned. What should we do now? The destructive power of that brocade immortal is too strong. We can't just leave it be. Don't worry. He's heading for the kiln anyway. So we're really just taking different paths to go to the same destination. Once everyone gathered around, Shelian briefly gave an account of what he had overheard earlier, leaving out some fine details. After he was done, the group of them sat down to space out. After all, there weren't any monsters to fight right now, and they didn't need to make the journey themselves, so it was rather empty and boring. Since Yin Yu said he really didn't know how to communicate with Chan Yijin, and just seeing his face gave him a headache, Shilian felt it wouldn't be wise to release him. So he was temporary so he was temporarily kept in the form of a Daruma doll. Pei Ming was bored, so he kept slapping at the doll to play. Oh shut up! Shilian saw the Daruma doll was wobbling heavily and felt sorry for it. General Play General Pei, please stop playing. Pei Ming complied. However, when Shilian grew drowsy and dozed off leaning against the mountain wall, he started slapping at it again. <laughs> There was no one to mind him, and Yin Yu, who was guarding the hole, mentally calculating how much distance was traveled, and looked over from the distance. Many a time, he looked like he wanted to say something, but in the end, nothing was said. Yet unexpectedly, in extreme joy, tragedies were born. Pei Ming was slapping around when suddenly Pei Su thud keeled over. Pei Ming instantly forgot about playing with the group playing and gripped Pei Su. Little Pei, what's wrong? Yin Yu quietly walked over and picked up the Druma doll and sat it down next to Xi Lian. Hua Chong was annoyed. What's with all the noise? He won't die. Can't you see his highness is asleep? <laughs> I love that Hua Chong is like, let my gege sleep, you morons. <laughs> Shilian was dozing for a while, and sure enough, he was woken by the noise. The moment he woke, he found he was leaning against Hua Chong's shoulder. Oh my god, of course! Hua Chong's voice sounded right next to his ear. Gege is awake? What's going on? It's nothing. If you're sleepy, you can take another nap. We'll be there soon enough. Just just keep sleeping on my shoulder, Gege! Oh my god! Shilian saw across from them that Pei Ming was clutching Pei Su's collar, violently shaking him. He was still slightly shocked, now more than awake. Thinking something was the matter, he went up to see. He said, oh, don't worry, General Pei. General Pei Jr. is just tired and hungry, and he couldn't hang on for the moment. Pei Su was mortal right now, that's all. Having struggled for so long without food and water, and without Shilian's extensive experience in starvation and beatings where one meal could sustain him for three days and take ten beatings meant nothing. Pei Su couldn't hang on anymore and finally collapsed. Pei Ming remarked, The mortal body is so inconvenient. Does anyone have anything to eat? No one responded. Ban Yu took out a pot. I'm sorry, but I only have this. It was the pot filled with toppled phoenixes! Pei Ming yelled, Why are you still holding on to that thing? Throw it out! They were loud, noisy and rowdy, and Hua Chong turned to Shilian and See, I told you it was nothing. Why not take another nap? The mountain spirit ran for a good whole day, and Shilian could see the skies were turning dark outside. How long have we been running now? Yin Yu had been counting by that hole and answered, we're close to 800 miles. This was definitely much faster than when they walked. Shilian also came to the edge of the hole. He was only going to take a casual look at first, but when his eyes swept to their surroundings, he suddenly saw something. Instantly, the hair on his neck stood up. What's that down there? Looking down from this mountain spirit in the black of night, below on the ground, was a giant human face. The face bore crescent eyes, its lip curled upward, and was smiling creepily. What the fudge? Shilian took a step back in spite of himself. Hua Chong was behind him and held him. Shilian steadied his mind and looked closer. The face was merely an image form by collective hills and ravines, an optical illusion, but this illusion looked very real, and with a glance it was a shocking sight. He wondered, what's that gully that resembles the eyelids and lips? That's the Wuyang River. 
the main river of Wuyong. Its source is in the high mountains, and the melted snow forms the river. Of course, now it's dried out completely. But to have reached here, it means we're very close to the kiln now. And the nose? It's a lively city next to the shore of Wuyong River. Want to go down and see? Is there anything worth seeing down there? I love that he's like, he's up against Hua Chong's back, asking him these very questions very intimately, and he like leans his head to look up at, at Hua Chong. Oh, 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 MXTX. <laughs> There's another divine temple of Wuyong in that city. If there was a temple, then there was a possibility of a mural. Well, well, let's go. He couldn't wait to learn more about the crown prince of Wuyang and Pei Ming piped up. Well, let's go. We have to find something edible for little Pei. How do we get down there? Okay. Hua Chong waved his hand and a few silver butterflies appeared, fluttering next to everyone, shimmering their light. They rested on everyone's shoulders, backs, hands, sleeves. Others who saw these little silver butterflies might grumble and wonder whether they could possibly bring them anywhere. But Shilian didn't say a word before releasing Ruiyi and tying everyone together. This way they wouldn't lose each other in midair. Yin Yu made a hole larger than there was enough space for at least five or six people to go through at the same time. Preparations complete, Shilian and company all came to the edge of the hole. Everyone get ready. Well, wait! General Pei, something the matter? There's been something I've been meaning to ask. What's that on your hands? Following his gaze, Shilian looked down and saw his own hand. He raised it, and only then did he realize the red string knotted on both his and Hua Chong fingers were still connected. <clears throat> this is a, a spiritual device of... For, for contact of sorts. Oh, Pei Ming said. Wouldn't it be inconvenient? It's a string after all. What if, what if you trip on it or it gets entangled somewhere? You know, accidents will happen. His reminder made a lot of sense, but for some mysterious reason, Shilian wasn't too willing to have the string cut off. Seeing his hesitant expression, like he was struggling internally, Hua Chong took a look and smiled. It certainly is a little inconvenient like this. Then and Shilian saw the red string disappear between their fingers. Now it's more practical, Hua Chong said. Oh! Shilian stared at the empty air where the red string had disappeared, a little dumbfounded. It only connected them for a short while before it was gone. Although it wasn't anything major, no, it should be said that it was something extremely minuscule. Still, he was a little forlorn. Afraid someone would notice, Shilian squeezed a smile. Mm -hmm. Oh, he says, let's go, ready. I, I bet this, I bet it's like an invisible string. It's still there. It's just so people won't comment on it. As long as he has the string wrapped around his hand, I, I feel like it's still going to be there. Like, come on. All right, let's go and jump. The mountain spirit was still charging forward by itself, and it didn't notice that all the little people the size of grasshoppers had left off of its body. Okay, enveloped by a circle of wraith butterflies, the group of them landed lightly like feathers without a hair harmed. The place of their landing was the bridge of the nose of that giant smiling face. Having straightened up, Shilin was perplexed. Well, San Long, is there a Wuyong temple in a city here? There is, but there's nothing here. It was true. He thought when they landed on the ground, he would see a small town, like sites of the, of the first divine temple. That he could see streets and shops and residents and wells and temples and so on. But before him was a field of flat, empty land, empty and barren, without a trace of the city had ever existed. Where's this lively city? Under your feet, Hua Chong said. What? Under Pei Ming's foot was that boulder. Is there some sort of secret mechanism? Come stand here, Hua Chong said. He pulled out the scimitar at Ming, aimed the tip downwards, and struck the ground right next to the boulder. The tip of the scimitar pierced into the ground. At first there was a cracking sound. Small cobweb-like fractures split the earth, and then the fracture spread rapidly. The cracks bigger and bigger, the fissures deeper and deeper. Finally, the entire section of the ground caved in with a boom, revealing a chilling dark hole. Hua Chong jumped in first, and Shilin hadn't realized he would take the first step. He rushed to the edge of the hole. Sun Long! Everything's fine down here. You can come down now. He went first to scout. Shilin sighed a breath of relief and jumped in. The others followed one after the other. It's so dark in here. Just as he had said so, several silver butterflies lit the darkness, dancing languidly and a number of ghost fires also appeared, instantly illuminating the deeper parts of the hole. What appeared before them was a long street. A thousand years ago, this would have been a bustling street, packed full of shops and large houses. The boulder Pei Ming had stepped on earlier was the rooftop of one of those buildings. Shilian looked up. I see. So this city was buried? Buried by what? An earthquake? Landslide? Volcanic ash, Hua Chong said. Volcanic ash of about seven meters in thickness buried the entire city underground. It's like Pompeii. 
what you see right now is part of what the demons and monsters had come to Mount Tonglu for previous trials had dug out. There were so many more sections that are still buried within the ashes, which meant the apocalypse in the Crown Prince of Guyong's dream had come true. Pei Ming put Pei Su down on the roadside and said, well, never mind all that for now. Where's the water? If there's anything to eat, a couple sips of water is good. If we're lucky, you'll find underground water deep down. Thus, Pei Ming and Ban Yu left to go find water. Convenient! And Xilin was still deep in thought when Hua Chong walked over. Gege, look at your hand. Xilin followed his direction without much thought, and only after he looked down to discover that while the red string was gone, the bright red knot on his third finger was still there. Hua Chong had explained before that when the red string between them breaks, the knot would disappear, so what was going on? Hua Chong smiled. It's just a small camouflage spell, that's all. The red string is hidden, the distance is now unrestricted, and you won't have to worry about tripping over it. But it didn't actually break. As long as the affinity knot is still there, then the person on the other end of the red string is safe. Once we're close to the kiln, dangers will increase. We don't know what's ahead of us just yet, so I thought this red string can still be untied. Still can't be untied. What do you think? Learning that the red string was still there, Shilian's lips curved upwards in spite of himself. But the moment he realized it, he straightened his expression and replied very seriously, Ah, yes. If that's the case, then we can know whether the other is safe. At a moment's notice, it's a very practical spell. Hua Chong flashed a smile, but it too soon, too, it soon disappeared. But your highness, there's something I must say. What? I know you can't die, and you're not afraid to die. But no matter how tough you are, don't think yourself of incapable of getting hurt. Not dying doesn't mean not getting hurt, and it definitely doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. When you see something strange and dangerous, don't touch it. Find me. Let me take care of it. Shilian suddenly recalled earlier when he touched those skulls covered in corpse poison with his hands. Hua Chong's expression instantly turned dark. He wondered in inwardly, was Hua Chong perhaps angry because of this then? Yes! <laughs> if that was truly the case, he really didn't know what to say. It was a moment before he complied. All right, I won't do that anymore. Hearing his sincere promise, Hua Chong seemed to be satisfied. He nodded and was just about to turn and continue onwards when Shilin called out, So long, wait! You too. If there's something dangerous you don't touch, you don't touch, I won't touch either, okay? Hearing this, Hua Chong's lips lifted. He took a step closer and was about to speak when they heard Pei Ming's voice from not far away. What is this? It looks like people. Indeed, but why would people turn into something like this? Turn into what? Shilian asked. Oh, oh, this, these chapters are so good. There's so much going on. Okay, okay. Chapter 165, Saint Born Under an Ominous Star. Oh! Pei Ming and the others had entered the yard of a residence, probably in search of a well. Shilian entered the yard and, and commented offhandedly, the houses in the street are also impressive. Hua Chong replied, the kiln is situated in the imperial capital, the heart of the kingdom of Wuyang. This place is close to the kiln, or rather, close to what was the imperial capital 2,000 years ago. So it's a place of wealth. Since it was mostly prominent figures and government officials who lived here, they're naturally impressive. There certainly was a well, only the site near that well was exceedingly horrifying. There were seven to eight people sprawled over the edge of the well, as if they were dying of thirst but still perished after having struggled to make it there. Upon closer inspection, Shilian blinked. This, rather than say they're people, they're more like stone statues. They have, were, of course, not live humans, but they weren't corpses, and definitely not skeletons. Each of them were coarsely made, ashen white stone statues. Shilian was about to reach out and touch when next to him, Wachong gave him a look. He immediately remembered that they had just promised each other not to touch anything strange and dangerous, so he forced down the impulse. Now thinking about it, who in the world would sculpt so many terrifying statues? They should be people indeed, but had transformed into this form for some reason. It's like Pompeii, right? There were front doors of this home wide open. Shilin looked to the inside of the house and saw there were two more people lying on the ground, their positions twisted in a tight embrace. Although their faces were blurred and their expressions unclear, judging by their actions, one could sense the terror had filled their hearts. There was a bundle of something tightly hugged between the two, Upon closer look, Shilian realized it must have been a baby. What had happened was more than clear. Those outside were this house's servants. 
and the ones inside should be the master's family of three. Yeah. After the volcano erupted, the Wuyang River's flow became, wa became running lava. The residents who lived in the high plains weren't burnt to death by the lava or blazing fires, but they couldn't escape the blanketing volcanic ash and died from suffocation. Volcanic ash instantly enveloped their whole bodies and formed a hard shell on the surface, preserving the last moments of those people, transforming them into stone statues. The old well was, of course, long since dried out. Peiming wasn't interested in studying the faces of the dead either, so he left, carrying Peisu with him and continued to search for water. Suddenly, Shilin noticed something strange. He flipped into the house, crouching down next to the stone bodies of the family of three. Hua Chong entered two and asked, what did you want to see? He, his brows furrowed slightly. I just think their positions are a bit strange. These two adults are holding each other tightly with one arm, but the other arm, the other arm was tucked against their chest as if they were gripping something firmly. You want to see what's in their hands, he asked. Shi Lian had only <coughs> nodded when Hua Chong tapped once on the joint, joint stone statues. Well, wait a minute, Shi Lian said. Wouldn't this be too disrespectful for their remains? However, Hua Chong moved faster than he did, and the family of three instantly broke into a pile of shattered ashen white shards. No need to be too concerned. They've long since been dead, and the remains were already no more. In that pile of shards was nothing. The stone statues were hollow inside. Although on the surface, the volcanic ash formed a solid protective shell, the corpse wrapped inside would still rot and break down. When the rotting was done, what was left was only the ashen shell. All lives must come to an end leaving behind only that which had never lived in the everlasting. Mm. Within the blocks and pieces of those ashen shards on the ground, there were some not yet fully rotten pieces of cloth and accessories on the host's body, such as rings, earrings, necklaces, and so on. Shillian felt that what this couple was gripping in their face of death couldn't possibly be jewelry, and was picking through the pieces when Hua Chong picked up something and handed it to him. What is this? It's what they were clutching in their hands. It was a pendant. A shimmering gold plate and something akin to bones were hanging off the chain. Upon the golden plate were engraved patterns, and Shilian lightly dusted off the ashes and the surface and looked at the details. The ominous star. What was depicted on the golden plate was a celestial drawing. Gold for the heavens, a gate for the stars. This is what they called the sign of the ominous star which was the celestial phase when the Star of Glowing Befuddlement stood in the Heart constellation. The Star of Glowing Befuddlement had historically been seen as the Star of War and Death, and when it rested in the Heart constellation, it was even more an ominous sign, especially towards rulers and emperors and other such leaders. So why was such a celestial drawing engraved on an accessory? This shouldn't have been an accessory. Shillian fumbled through the shards of the ashen shells again and found the other two pendants looked exactly the same. There were three in total. Even in the baby, even the baby in the couple's arms had one. Under what circumstances would the same accessory be kept three times? This couldn't be a protection charm, could it? Only protection charms could give those at the brink of death the urge to grip them tightly, to pray madly within the last vestiges of hope amidst terror. It is. I've dug through a part of this city too, and I've discovered this protection charm on quite a number of statues. The people of Wuyang worship their crown prince, so this should be the protection charm of the crown prince. But why draw this celestial fray, this phase, on the protection charm? Does the crown prince have any connection to the ominous star? The star of glowing. I'm like, is the is is the crown prince Hua Chong reincarnated? Is Bai Wu Sheng ominous and a crown prince together? What? The star of glowing befuddlement and resting in the heaven constellation, the ominous star in translation. Okay. Ancient Chinese astronomers believed that Mars was unstable in both position and light, and they called it the Star of, Gro of Glowing Befuddlement. It symbolized ruin, pestilence, death, famine, war, like the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and other such bad omens. The Heart Constellation in Chinese astrology sits in the east by Scorpio, and symbolizes the Crown Prince, the Emperor, and depending on where in the constellation, the Commoner. Thus, when Mars enters the heart constellation and moves within it, it is often interpreted as foretelling major changes in politics and dynasties, the fall of greatness. Ha! Huh, okay, I want to go back to that in the discussion and relate it to Hua Chong and Shi Lian, the two of them together, because they seem like they, they seem like they are like the star of glowing befuddlement in the heart constellation. Hmm. But 
We're going to go back to that, I guess. Huh. Because the day he was born, it was the celestial phase of the ominous star. So the people of Wuyang used this celestial phase to symbolize him. How did you find this out? It's written on it. Sure enough, on the backside there was an engraved column of characters. Watch on explains. These words mean saint born under an ominous star. Maybe now in the present, having the star of glowing befuddlement rest in the heart constellation is a grave omen, but things might have been different 2,000 years ago. Shilian stroked the line of words, his heart slowly sinking. Since on the day he was born, it was also the sign of an ominous star. Was this not too coincidental? Oh my god! So if the Goshi was serving the crown prince of Wuyang and he was born under an ominous star and he saw all this go down then when he saw Hua Chong years ago in Shanla he thought the same thing was going to happen and they had to get rid of him oh oh this is getting good y'all this is getting good okay let's go to the divine temple the two walked down the long street side by side Pei Ming and the others weren't fruitful in their search of the area so they followed along too there were many remnants of carriages on the streets, some resting by the roadside, some completely overturned on the ground. There were also a number of scattered stone people lying about the ground, each with bizarre mannerisms, but the majority had gone back to their own homes to escape the disaster. So those were homeless beggars or travelers that couldn't make it to their home in time. The cries and struggles in that moment before death were all preserved, and the group of them traversed through this bizarre sight. Yeah, that would be terrifying, right? Hua Chong pointed out for Xi Lian which ones were residences of wealthy merchants, which ones belonged to the entertainment district. Xi Lian couldn't help ask, so long, the kingdom of Wu Yong has been fallen for over 2,000 years, and there aren't any descendants left, so how did you learn to read their words? He couldn't have just forcefully learned from nothing. There should have been a door to the method. It's not too difficult, Hua Chong said. Gege can see that some of the Wu Yong characters are very close to the modern characters. It's true. The two characters from Wuyang are very close to modern characters. Right. So those two characters were the first of the Wuyang learns words I learned. There's a few more that are like this, and when mixed in a phrase, the rest of the words can be deduced. There are some that have the same character but different meanings, but not too many. And then there are words that show up more frequently, like these two. He pointed at the two buildings on the street. It's easy to tell what kind of place this is. On the sign, the words on the top are different, but on the bottom, they are the same. Therefore, what the bottom words mean can be easily determined. It's a tavern or a restaurant, and there are many ways to do this. If Gege wants to know more, I'll tell you when there's time. I'll be your Rosetta Stone, Shelian. Just don't you worry. I could be a language teacher if you want one. <laughs> so that was it. There were actually people in the world who could use their own power to figure out everything without any help. Shelian couldn't help but be awed. The Divine Temple of Wuyang was still the grandest and most impressive building in the city. The group of them arrived before the temple, and before they entered, Pei Ming suddenly spoke up. What's that noise? Squeak, 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 squeak. The noise came from far. Oh my god, no. I Okay, rats, Julian wondered. I was like, if it's a damn swing, and Bai Wusheng is swinging from it in front of them, I will lose my shit. But okay, no. Rats. Not your typical rats. Are these, the, are these like the Princess Bride rats? The rats of unusual size? Not your typical rats, but if they're rats, that means that there's water nearby. Ah, there we go. When they entered the temple this time, there were, no tra there were no traces of burnings on the wall. They could see, just by raising their heads, the immense vibrant colors of the mural. However, this time there wasn't one mural, but left, center, right, three sets. There was a mural on each of the three walls. Oh, okay, good, 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 three murals. All right. The group of them came before the first mural and looked up. The crown prince of Wuyang was sitting upon the clouds. His body shone with golden light. However, his expression was severe. In his left hand was a ball of light, and within the glow there was a small mountain that was spewing flames. In his right hand, his five fingers were pressed together, his palm facing forward, seeming to be waving. Below was a palace. And the palace stood over ten people, each of their attire and accessories lavish and sumptuous, and each of their gestures were different. Some had their arms wide open, some were donning armor and carrying bows, and some were ponting into the far distance with an agitated expression. Maybe it's pointing? The details of the painting were complex and abundant, and Shilian studied for a good while before turning around. Let me tell you what I've gathered from this painting. The ball of light held in the hand of the crown prince of Wuyang contains the scene of the volcanic eruption, 
which meant he told his dreams to those down below. As for the gesture of his right hand, it's obviously a rejection, so he must be dismissing something. But what's he dismissing? That depends on the actions of the people below. The palace is situated in the mortal realm, lavish and glamorous, so it should be the royal palace. These people should be the royalty and nobility of Wuyong. This one with his arms wide open, judging by his actions, he's making the expand gesture. Expand what? That's what's told by what's in his hand. The crowd looked closer, and what was in his hand was a map. Expand the territory. Yes. And these generals are all donned in armor, looking ready to dispatch into battle. There are those on the side pointing the way. Look, their directive actions are very obvious. They're saying, fight there. With this, the meaning of the mural is easier to understand. It seems the crown prince of Wuyong told his dream to the ministers in the royal palace. Once the volcano erupted, the consequences would be severe, and it would be a disaster that could bring ruin to the kingdom of Wuyong. The territory of the kingdom isn't big enough because the volcano is situated in the center, so the cities with great significance will perish. So how is this solved? If their own territory isn't big enough, go take over someone else's, Hua Chong said. Right, Xilian said. So the minister suggested opening up the borders and invading the neighboring country, but the crown prince doesn't agree with this method, which is why his right hand is a gesture of rejection. After analyzing the first mural, the group of them came to the second mural. The first mural's a lot like uh, what was going on with Shanla, but kind of in reverse, like Yang and coming to Shanla. It's, it's kind of a reverse situation, but we'll talk about this in discussion. The colors of this mural were much gloomier than the previous one. Perhaps it was because what it depicted was the scene of slaughter on the battlefield. Below on the battlefield, blood flowed like rivers, and the soldiers on both sides killed relentlessly. Shilin could tell which side was Wuyang, since the soldiers' armor was exactly the same as the generals from the previous painting. The Wuyang soldiers looked savage and aggressive, trampling the heads of their enemies under their feet, corpses raised on halberds, arms and legs and bloody flesh flewn in the, sl in the slaughter, bloody and cruel. There were even soldiers with savage smiles who reached for children and women huddled in balls, truly the horrors of war. Above the battlefield, the gloomy clouds were thick, yet within the clouds there peaked a silver-white light. The crown prince of Wuyang peeked half his body from the clouds to watch the scene below, his expression that of fury. One of his arms was extended out, releasing many pillars of golden light, and the Wuyang soldiers in the light were all sucked up. This painting's meaning was easier to analyze than the previous one. Xilian studied it for a moment. He said softly, It seemed the generals and ministers didn't listen to the crown prince's advice, and still dispatched armies to invade the neighboring country. The soldiers killed too much, even harassing the women, children, and the weak from the other kingdom. So when the crown prince found out, he was angered and moved to stop the aggression of the Wuyang soldiers. Pei Ming heard, and he said flatly, well, how touching, but to be honest, if one of the kingdoms must perish, then choosing to protect your own can't be helped. The soldiers charging in the front lines, if they hadn't yet been cut down by enemies, they would have died from the rage of their own crown prince. I certainly wouldn't want to fight for a king like that. Shilian chuckled dryly a couple times and said woefully, oh, yeah, 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 General Pei is, um, um, right. <laughs> but Hua Chong, on the other hand, grunted coldly. Pei Ming continued, so the volcano is about to erupt. What does this highness the crown prince plan to do? He can't just let his own people wait for their death. Let's look at the third painting. It should have the answer. The group of them finally came before the last painting. The colors of this mural were an enormous contrast to the previous one. It had returned to bright and vibrant, filled with holy light. However, <laughs> with just the first look, Shilin was shocked to the core. He widened his eyes. Pemi took a look. My God, is this the idea that the Crown Prince of Wuyang came up with? Ha! Huh! Daring, worthy of admiration. On the third mural, at the bottom of the painting was the kingdom of Wuyang. The Wuyang River flowed wildly across the earth, and the crown prince with his four guardian deputies were also in it. However, they weren't the focal point. Within this painting, the most prominent object, what was at the center, was a bridge. A giant bridge, shining with white light, was held up by the crown prince of Wuyang and his four guardians, and the people on the ground were swarming towards the bridge with smiles covering their faces. The crown prince had built a bridge that connected the heavens and earth with the intention of bringing his people into the heavenly realm. Oh, well, um, that would solve the problem. 
Aha! Oh my gosh. Oh. Saint born under the ominous star, part two. Shelly was speechless looking at the mural. He can do that? Why not? Watchon countered. Everyone looked at him and Watchon continued. Isn't appointing generals just bringing mortals to the heavenly realm? If he's just pulling everyone within the vicinity to the royal capital and the heavens temporarily, and once the disaster's over, sending them back, why can't he do it? <laughs> Crimson rain, soft flower, don't make this sound so easy, Pei Ming said. My lord should know appointing generals takes spiritual power. This is how many he's appointing? To appoint generals in reality. Okay, so we're explaining why this is not like something that happens all the time was to use one's own spiritual power to nurture a true mortal in the heavens, to be used by oneself. Otherwise, if there's no restriction, why wouldn't every heavenly official just appoint all the people they wanted? Why wouldn't an emperor just bring up his entire harem and his entire court, and a general might as well appoint his entire army? Judging by the relics he left behind, the entirety of the kingdom of Wuyang was only about 100,000 in population. The vicinity of the royal capital was probably only some 10,000. Shilin said quietly, it, it might be tough, but it was still doable, though just barely. Even if it's a few ten, tens of thousands, there's still no heavenly official who dare appoint that many. If he really went through with it, then I can't tell if he should be congratulated on his courage or extreme stupidity. At least there's definitely no one like him in history. Shilin studied that bridge in the mural, completely engrossed. In his eyes, the faces of that white-clad crown prince and his four guardian deputies were looking more and more peculiar more and more like his own face and the faces of the four Goshi. He then recalled the celestial phase of the ominous star. The story was so much like the tale of reincarnation. This story was that, this story that was so much like a tale of reincarnation made him eager to learn what happened next, but at the same time, he felt perhaps he already knew. He didn't dare to keep looking at the mural anymore and he turned away. Has water been found? Banyu was dragging Pei Sun and replied, That Gege went to look. She was referring to Yin Yu. Shilin glanced at Pei Su, who had his eyes closed. Humming for a moment, he decided to speak up. I think when we go onwards to the kiln later, it'd be best if General Pei Jr. should stay here. Pei Su was in the body of a mortal, after all, inconvenient in many ways. Besides, they still didn't know what awaited them ahead. Pei Ming squatted down and looked Pei Su over. Yeah, I agree. But will your highness please not tell him the reason in front of him? The child will understand. Just leave it to me to tell him. Rest assured, General Pei, I understand. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said it while he was still unconscious. Pei Su was once a young martial god with an infinitely bright future in the heavens, after all. Now that he was to stay behind because he couldn't keep up, he'd feel bitter. However, mistakes must be punished, and this is how exile should feel, so he, should, so he could only accept it. They remained in the temple and discussed for a while. Shilian wondered, puzzled, where's he and you? How come he hasn't come back after so long? Never let anybody leave by themselves in this story. Ever. Has he not found water yet? Hua Chong, on the other hand, was staring intently at a few wraith butterflies resting on his fingertips. The butterflies were very useful earlier, and now they'd all returned to him, tucked away to save energy. He looked up slightly. He shouldn't take this long. Shilian grew alarmed and stood up. Well, let me go take a look. General Pei, watch over things. San Long, come with me. Of course they would go together. Thus, Shilian left Ruiyi behind and had it, tie, had it tie a protection circle. The two left the temple and went towards the deeper part of the underground city. There were plenty of houses and clutters of things on the way. Shilian picked up a jar that he rather liked, and Hua Chang seemed to have found it funny. What are you doing picking that up? Well, if we find water later, we can use it to bring some back for General Pei Jr., Shilian said. He'd gotten used to collecting scraps after all, and he patted the jar in his hands in spite of himself. Come to think of it, this is an antique, thousands of years old. If you like stuff like this, come over to my place afterwards. I've got a few items, and you can see if you find anything else you like. <laughs> An instant's time later, the two finally heard the sound of water flowing. Over there! There was indeed a hidden, hidden river at the bottom. Shillian placed the jar he'd picked up in the water and started washing it heartily. Thousands of years' worth of ashes already formed a thick shell. It couldn't be washed off. But just washing off the dust on the surface, the jar would still make a passable for use. He filled it with water and lowered his head, ready to take a sip. When Hua Chong, who surveyed the area, saw, turned and saw him, he immediately cautioned, don't drink it. What? So hot. There were only two of them there. So where'd the third voice come from? Is it Ian Yu? Shilin unconsciously looked to where the voice came from, and the voice was coming from the jar in his hand. 
He instantly looked down, and the jar were two scarlet dots floating in the water watching him. What was that thing? No matter how he looked, it was a pair of eyes. The moment those eyes met his, that thing bolted straight for Shillian's face. The water splashed, and Shillian's hands moved swiftly, flinging the jar of meters away in an instant. It smashed against the wall, and clunk, the thousand-year-old antique shattered. As for the thing hidden inside, it took no time to scurry off into the darkness. In the rush, Shillian didn't see what it was clearly, only that it was a big bundle of something black. What was that thing? She, Hua Chong was shielding in front of him, and Shillian was feeling a little woeful. It wasn't in that jar before, was it? No. It swam into it from the waters. They're often creatures that flock together and swim in this hidden river. That's why I told you not to drink it. But you'd let General Pei Jr. drink it. <laughs> Shillian thought inwardly! Suddenly he felt a chill in his back. Who's there? Someone coughed in the distance. It definitely wasn't a delusion. He immediately tensed and alert. Soon after, babble and chatter came pouring in like a tide. From all around the two of them, pair after pair of red dots lit up, surrounded them, encircling them in the middle. Don't worry, they're not human, Hua Chong said. It's precisely because they're not human that we have to worry, all right, Shilian thought. Listening closely to the chatter, Shilian deduced what the voices were saying. Oh, it's so hot, it's so hot, I'm burning. Ooh, I'm suffocating, is everyone there? I can't move, I can't move. The voices were tiny, but clear and full of pain, like little ants crawling into his ears. Shilian was ready to reach for Feng Shin when a voice, voice cried sharply, Your Highness, where's your Highness? Save me, save me! The last cry made all the hairs on Shilian's neck stand up. And in that instant, he thought the voice was calling for him. But Hua Chong waved his hand, releasing thousands of wraith butterflies, and they charged at the red glowing eyes. Where the silver rats shimmered their light, they illuminated the countless creatures that were chattering in the dark. They weren't human, they were rats. I've said there were lots of rats here, let's go. Are those rats? Why do they look more like cats to me? It was true, they were bigger than a kitten. The hairs black like ink, thick like needles. Their red eyes glowed aggressively in the dark. And many were perched on the walls, watching them closely, speaking the tongue of men, creepy to the extreme. Once the silver butterflies charged at them, they started slaughtering one another. The rat, red and silver lights flashed and crossed, the state of the battle unknown, but very vicious and violent. Yin Yu couldn't have been dragged off somewhere by those creatures, could he have been? He shouldn't be that useless. It's probably something else has stripped him up. Hua Chong said. The first part made Shilian relax slightly, but the last part made him tense up again. Well, never mind how big the rats are. Why are there so many? Why do they each grow so big? Simple. The dead, of course. They're corpse-eating rats. When the city was covered by volcanic ash, the people in the large domestic beasts like oxen, horses, and lambs had nowhere to hide, but the rats dug deeply in the underground and depended on the air and stored sustenance in the caves in order to survive. Once the dust had settled, they emerged from the holes anew and scoured the now hellish city for food. However, everything was destroyed. Everything was either buried by lava or covered in volcanic ash, and they gnawed through many things but couldn't find food for the longest time. Until one day, they smelled the scent of rot. The rotten smell came from the humanoid stone statues. The corpses were wrapped in a thinner layer of ash and shell. When they started the rot, rot they watched a, sm a smelly stench, and the corpse water flowed. Thus, the starving rats surrounded and bustled next to the statues, biting small holes and scurrying inside and gnawing at the corpses from within. Oh, I see. So that's why they would say those things. I was wondering why they would say those words. What did you say? What did I say? What did they say? What did you hear? Well, Song Long, didn't you hear? It's just so hot and suffocating. They can't move. Save me and such. That wasn't right. What those corpse-eating rats repeated was the hatred of the Wuyang people, so naturally it would be in the Wuyang tongue. So why could he understand the Wuyang tongue? Oh my gosh! What? 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 Oh no! Oh my god! Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> because
because Sheely Ann, when he started giving all his theories, I was like, oh yes, that is exactly what I did the recap. And I'm like, we're on the same page. We're on the same page. We're, we're thinking the same things. And then it suddenly started getting to this weird reincarnation territory. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> because some things are starting to come to light. Then I'm like, hold on, hold up, wait a minute. That could be really, it could be nothing. And we need to talk about Hua Chong with it and, and what it all could mean. But I was like, there's some theories. Now, of course, it's MXTX. So is, has she laying cracked the code now? I don't think so. I don't think she, I think some of these things could be cracking the code, but I don't think that Shelian knows, I don't think Shelian's fully figured it out yet, right? There's going to be some more surprises and twists. There has to be. But, and I feel like we maybe are getting into some territory like that, but I brought out the unresolved plot points. As soon as I resolve a plot point, we exchange it with something else, right? Because we still don't know about the Ascensions, Still don't know about the Fiat Spirit. Still don't know about the promotion. Still don't know about Mu Ching. Still don't know about Ling Wen. Ling Min, though, there, we're going to add to this that they are MIA uh, for now. Awesome. <laughs> Great. They're going to show up later, and that's going to be terrifying. Um, the Goshi of Shanla and the Wu Yong mural. Um, I'm going to put down here, and we're going to change this up just a little bit because the murals at this point aren't necessarily the mystery. That's not the mystery anymore. And the mountain spirits. We're going to put the mountain spirits on here because, yeah, we need to talk about them. And then the thing about it is, we're going to kind of come down here. Uh, we still don't know about Long Ying. The Windmaster and Heshan was hinted at last week. Still don't know about them. Uh, the Rainmaster, they're still out mucking about somewhere. Who knows? Um, we also need to add, though, we can take off this who's the Goshi with. They're with the mountain spirits. I was like, oh, yeah. I thought it was somebody they were talking through through a private communication array, but no, they're talking with the mountain spirits. But, and then Hua Chong, or Shilin recognizing Hua Chong, we haven't got that yet, the ring, whatever. Bai Wu Sheng, we're gonna touch on that. Um, but, the Rain Master, still don't know about that. And then we need to add to this, kind of <coughs> to bring our arrow down here, because why not? But we need to add to the idea of is she Lian? Is she Lian the Wu Yong Prince? Okay. Is he like reincarnated as the Wu Yong Prince? I I feel like at this point in the story, we're on the fifth volume. We still have three volumes to go. I don't think he is, but I'm, we're gonna talk about this, right? And I apologize because Huckleberry is like wanting me to play with him, even though we just got done playing before I started this video. You know how it goes. So I, I again, math is not my strong suit. <laughs> and we had four chapters again this week. Now next week we're doing chapters 167, 168, and 169. So we're only doing three chapters next week and then we're finishing up volume five with chapters 170, 171 and 172. So the next two sets are going to be three chapter sets. This is the last four chapter for now. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. But yeah, I was just like, wow, we had a lot of content to go with this, right? But yeah, so the whole thing with the Goshi, Shelian has every right to be freaked out because it's like, you haven't seen this person in 800 years. Everything from your past is starting to all come up again. It's like, of course you'd be terrified about it, but there's some weird stuff going on. And I want to write out what that weird stuff is because I'm like, what, what are we doing show? What's happening? Okay. Because Shelian talks about here. He talks about how um, him and she, of course, him and Hua Chong. I love the idea that they're they're stuck in this little space and they have to be right next to each other. And Hua Chong's like, "Don't worry, Gigi, I won't move if you won't move." Like Son, like Son Long is just eating this up. Hua Chong is just eating all of this up, being like, "I love every second of this." And then Shi Lian thinks, as they're being like, as everything's crumbling all around them and they're being forced to sit next to one another, Shi Lian's thinking of the line, "The to be buried with you." He says here to be buried with you, to be buried together doesn't feel so bad. Mm -hmm. I think of the Smith song, um, it's There is a Light that never goes out. He's like, to die by your side is such a heavenly way to go or like something like that. Um, I feel like it's like the Smith song that shows up when I hear that line. So they ask where, so he says, what about the other two? Where did they run off to? The other two are the mountains. So let's, let's bring up what's happening in this, in this episode, this chapter set. We have the Goshi, all right? We have the Goshi and the three mountains. 
I think, very much like Shi Lian thinks, that the Goshian Three Mountains are the four are the four deputies of the Wuyang Crown Prince. I think that that's correct. I think that's right. I think they're the four. I think they are the four deputies. The four deputies of Wuyang. And for some reason, now there's some questions with that. I'm going to change markers up here. There are some questions with that. Why are three mountains and one is not? Um, can it become, can the Goshi of Shanla become a mountain? Can it be a mountain? And we know that they are old age, sickness, and then birth and death. So I, I think it makes sense that the Goshi is the other mountain. I, I think it does. I thought it was Mount Tonglu, but I think it makes sense that the mountains are actual people, that they are spirits that have been converted. I think that that's the case. The question is, why are they mountains? How did they get to this point? What happened, right? What What's the whole point of that? How did that be? The only thing that kind of makes this weird is... There, there is the question of how long have these mountains been at Mount Tonglu? Because that's the only thing. Because if they were around during Shanla, if they were around during Shanla times, then when, the big question is, when did they go to Mount Tonglu? Right? I mean, technically we haven't had a, we haven't had a, a supreme ghost Ma Chong will be the next supreme ghost, and then Heshan, and Chi Rong's not a supreme ghost. And Bai Wu Sheng was clearly, for all we know, before then. So that's important to note. So Mount Tonglu did not birth anybody until Hua Chong and Heshan, right? So we don't think that Bai Wu Sheng, Bai Wu Sheng was not from the Tonglu with the mountains. Okay, that would make sense. So it couldn't be, Bai Wusheng could not have been, if Bai Wusheng was a product of Mount Tonglu, which we still don't know if that's true or not, we don't think it is because the only ones that are talked about are Heshan and, and Huachong, then Bai Wusheng was at least not around Mount Tonglu when the four of them were in Shanla. So, I, uh, so yeah, if, if Bai Wusheng was a supreme ghost created from Mount Tonglu, it was before the mountain spirits showed up. That's all that we know, right? And then we assume the mountain spirits were around by the time Hua Chong and Heshan were created because Hua Chong remembered the mountain spirits. So he remembered them from back when he was there. So they've been hanging out, which would kind of explain why they've not been around Shi Lian all this time. They've been at Mount Tonglu preventing other demons from going to the kiln. That makes sense. That ties where they've been this whole time. But why is the Goshi allowed to become... Uh, in human form and not in mountain form unless he was just the one maybe he's the only one that can change back I don't know maybe he's the only one that has that ability I'm not sure but Bai Wu Shang is not from the same Mount Tonglu where the mountains were so we can we can deduce that right we can deduce that and so he says he asks where the other two mountain spirits are. He says, thank them for their efforts, but there's no reason to worry about the small fry anymore. None will come of them. We've got more important things to do. So the small fry, I'm assuming, are referring to the other demons and ghosts. He's like, forget them. We don't need them. We found the crown prince. We found the crown prince and we found Hua Chong. We don't need anybody else. Whatever. So uh, there, there's a lot of questions that go on in this, right? There are a lot of questions that we need to talk about. Like, for example, the Goshi, they've just, they've up and decided they no longer need, I, here's the thing, I was wondering how this timeline was going to work, because I was thinking, you know, when they said it took decades before the ghost, before the ghost made it to Mount Tonglu, I was like, oh god, this series is gonna, like, we're gonna have a big old time jump, <laughs> we're gonna go, like, on the next three volumes, we're gonna span ten years worth of time, it's gonna be like the book Hundred Years of Solitude, like, it's gonna just take a long time. Hell no, no, we're speed running this bitch. We're getting two days. We got two days, right? And my markers need to be drastically replaced. We have two days until Mount Tonglu and we get to the kiln. And at this point in the story, we've traveled over 800 miles, which is insanity. So they got two days before they get to the kiln. Now here's the weird part. So they have 
it, they, the Goshi knows in their clutches that they have Hua Chong and Shi Lian, and he makes the comment that Shi Lian at this point is likely beyond saving. So, so the Goshi was talking to the mountain spirits and they were all concerned about Shi Lian. So the theory about the mountain spirits being the other Goshi too makes sense because it makes sense in that situation because they would have all been at Shanla the same time as Shi Lian. They would know him as the crown prince. They would be concerned about him. I hadn't even taken that into consideration. I forgot there were four Goshi with Shi Lian. I forgot that detail and so now it's like, yeah, okay. So they say he's beyond saving, meaning they can't get him away from Hua Chong. He's not gonna, they can't convince him otherwise. He's not going, meaning he's not, not going to listen to what they consider to be reason. So instead, they're just gonna take, they're gonna take Shi Lian and the others straight to the kiln. So the question is, why? Why take Shi Lian straight to the kiln? What's the point? What I don't understand, that's the part I don't understand is why take Shili into the kiln, right? Because he's not a ghost. He's a heavenly official. He's ascended. So, because for a part of me was like, okay, they're going to use, they're going to make Shili into the supreme ghost. And I'm like, okay, but can they do that? I mean, I guess technically, but Shili was exiled. He was exiled like Pei Su. He was exiled like um, Yin Yu is, but then he ascended a third time. So he's technically ascended right now. So he can't become a Supreme Ghost if he's already ascended, right? So what's the point of taking him to the kiln? Who are you trying to make into a Supreme Ghost? That's the question. My question is, I guess, why, why take to the kiln who are we making a supreme ghost can't be Hua Chong he's already a supreme ghost um the only ghosts that are with them are Rong Guang, Kamo, Ban Yu I don't think neither any one of those three is going to become a supreme ghost so what's the point and they don't seem concerned about it so what is the deal yeah. that that's the one thing I don't understand is why 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 take him to the kiln if you're trying to kill Shi Lian and get him out of the way because he's beyond saving, who are you gonna have him fight in the kiln? Unless Bai Wu Shang is there, but but here's the thing. No, here's the thing. That's what we got. This whole awakening thing is the is the one weird part of it that doesn't make much sense, right? So Shi Lian's trying to figure out what this whole thing with the ghost she is, and he knows that he's talking to somebody. And so he says, in two days, we're going to the kiln. Call the other two mountains over. Let's go to the kiln together. In order to face his highness, the crown prince, not a single one of us should be missing. Right now, he's not, he's still not yet awakened. But if he should awake, if he should wake, it's hard to imagine what he will do this time. This time. Okay. So this whole awakening business, we'll talk about this awakening business. Okay. With the awakening it to me could refer to one of three things, right? Or he's not yet awakened. I don't think they're talking about Hua Chong because Hua Chong is already awakened back up. He's back in adult form. I They say what he'll do this, it's hard to imagine what he'll do this time if he should wake. I feel like they would notice that Hua Chong had woke up and they would make note of that because he's inside the mountain spirit and the mountain spirit can tell. So I don't know, I don't know. So either one, it's referring to Shilian. That's what Shilian thinks. Shilian thinks about maybe he might be the reincarnated uh, crown prince of Wuyang. Maybe. But I, I'm with Hua Chong. I don't think it's that simple. I don't think it's that simple. That he and maybe Shilian is a vessel for the crown prince. Maybe the crown prince is like. Maybe the crown prince of Wuyang is like the god of this world. Like it's the spiritual entity and it just kind of passes on kingdom to kingdom. And the prince of Wuyang was the previous vessel and then things went awry and then it transported and was reborn into Shi Lian. And now Shi Lian is the vessel for the crap for the this crown prince of Wuyang, whatever its deity is. I don't know. It would kind of go back to Shi Lian being like, I don't worship gods, I am God. 
and that whole speech being like, no, Shelian is the actual original deity. He just keeps getting reborn as a different person. We'll tie that up in a minute, right? Or they're saying that it's Bai Wu Shang. Bai Wu Shang has been asleep all this time, not dead, not dead, like Jun Wu says he is asleep, and they're afraid that once he awakens, what will he do? And that maybe he awoke, maybe he awoke last time and destroyed Shanla. That could be too. That could be that the last time Bai Wu Shang could be the crown prince of Wuyang, which is my theory. My theory is Bai Wu Shang was the crown prince. Things went awry. He ended up becoming a ghost somehow. Maybe the same way they're going to try to make Shilian a ghost to fight him. I don't know. But it could be that he, last time Bai Wu Shang woke up, they destroyed Shanla and then died and went back into slumber, right? And so now they're afraid that he's going to wake up this time and what's he going to do? I don't know. But I think, I, I've said since the beginning, I think since volume one, I felt like Shilian and Bai Wu Shang were connected. I felt like they were connected, right? What if, what if, I'm just throwing this out here. What if this like deity, what if this deity, and we'll just call it the crown prince. What if this deity, the crown prince, is something that transfers that transfers vessel to vessel and it just it inhabits a person each generation or so and that person has the potential to ascend let's just say that they have the potential to ascend okay so let's say that the crown prince of Wu Yong was Bai Wu Shang let's say that was the case I have theory and Bai Wu Shang ascended and then descended after something happened. Like after something happened in the heavenly realm, they descended and became a ghost. I don't know how, I don't know why, I'm just throwing the theory out there. But who knows? But that would kind of, the thing that's weird right now is that I feel like Bai Wu Shang and Shilin are connected. I don't know how, but I feel like they're connected because I feel like Bai Wu Shang is connected to Wu Yang somehow. I feel like that's why they ended up in Shanla. I feel like Bai Wu Shang feels that he and Shi Lian are kindred spirits somehow. And the thing that makes me think that all the more is that in their fight, the only fight that Shi Lian and Bai Wu Shang have that we know of, in the fight when Shi Lian tackles him and rips off the mask after Bai Wu Shang says, here's how you stop the human face disease, we see that Bai Wu Shang had Shilian's face. Meaning, are they the same person? Can you be two people at once? Is it is Shilian's soul just split into two and one is Bai Wu Shang and one is himself? And Shilian's soul just gets reincarnated over? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm losing my mind because I don't know. And I trust MXT, MXTX is going to give us answers. Of course, they give us crumbs as we go. But I just feel like there's some connection between them. There's some reason Bai Wu Sheng was having Shi Lian's face and to make himself look like Shi Lian in the moment. There's some connection between Bai Wu Sheng, Wu Yang, and Shanla. Is Shi Lian the reincarnated crown prince from Wu Yang? Did he die? Did Bai Wu Sheng kill Shi Lian when he was the former crown prince of Wu Yang? Was Bai Wu Sheng his sworn enemy and killed him? And then he showed back. That could be too. It could be that Shi Lian faced off against Bai Wu Sheng when they were, when he was the crown prince of Wu Yang and then destroyed Wu, they both seemingly destroyed each other and then they came back and Bai Wu Sheng found him in Shanla and was like, oh, you're the crown prince of here now, okay. And the ghost she followed where they found Shi Lian as the reincarnated prince were because they're like, oh, the reincarnated, the prince of Wu Yang reincarnated. It's now this Shi Lian. Let's try to make the thing from before not reoccur and Bai Wu Sheng came and screwed it up. And so now it's just this cycle of, it's the cycle of Shilian and Bai Wu Sheng constantly facing off against each other. But if Bai Wu Sheng is gone, then why does the Goshi feel the need to take Shilian to the kiln? What's the point? Unless maybe they're afraid that Bai Wu Sheng is going to get reborn again, like he was back during Shanla, and try to destroy the world all over again. Maybe they're, maybe Shilian and Bai Wu Sheng are two spirits that are constantly like opposing one another throughout time and reincarnating constantly. 
And so the Goshis maybe are trying to prevent Bai Wusheng from getting reborn. They're like, we got to bring the prince here. He's not going to listen to us, so we're just going to drag him here against his will, and then we'll go from there. Maybe. I don't know. But it just seems like these are all connected together, right? So, I, again, it's it's really fascinating, right, that, that this is all happening. Now, we get a brief intermission with Yin Yu and Qi Ying. And I feel for Qi Ying so much because he's just like, Xi Zhang, there you are. And Yin Yu's like, you've got the wrong person. And he's like, no, you're right here. Like, he's so innocent. I do think it's nice to know that after all these centuries, Qi Ying has grown a little bit. To learn to fake being dead. <laughs> That's the one trick he learned after like 400 years. It's great. But yeah, he's like, don't come near me. And it's so sad because Yin Yu, Yin Yu just doesn't, he feels so guilty about what happened to Qi Ying, as you would imagine. And so he just, he's like, Yin Yu doesn't know how to apologize. He doesn't want to know what to say. He just wants to stay away from him because he doesn't want to be near him. And Chi Ying's already forgave him. Chi Ying has, for, that's like all in the past. Chi Ying's like, I just want to be by you, Shi Zhang. And I, I really hope, I really hope that Chi Ying and Yin Yu make up. I want them to make up by the end of the story and be together. Even if like, I, if Yin Yu has to carry little tiny Chi Ying around as a Daruma doll, I want it to happen. I love that he's a little Daruma doll. And I love that Pei Ming's sitting there hitting him back and forth. Pei Ming's like a little kid. He's just like, like a little cat. He's like, Pei Ming, you're supposed to, I thought you were into pussycats that you were not one yourself. <laughs> I can't go without making fun of Pei Ming at least once a week. It's just, it's a granted that's going to happen. I just, I love that Yin Yu is just like, your highness. And the cool and kind of coincidental thing is that I feel like Yin Yu, I feel like both Yin Yu and Hua Chong, I think I know why they're connected. I feel like Hua Chong feels for Yin Yu because Yin Yu feels so guilty for having hurt Qi Ying. And maybe Hua Chong relates to, to him that way because Hua Chong, he hates seeing Xi Lian be hurt. And so I feel like Hua Chong's like, oh, Yin Yu, I know how you feel. You feel guilty about like all this pain and suffering coming across Qi Ying, who you care about. I feel the same way about Xi Lian. So I can totally relate to that. I feel like that's the one thing that might connect Hua Chong to Yin Yu and make him like respect him and understand him. The funny thing is that Hua Chong is so confident and wants to be around Xi Lian all the time now. And Yin Yu's like, get him away, get him away. I don't want him to see me. I, I love that. That's so wonderful, right? I just, I think that's so hilarious that how, how contrasted they are, but yet they both have that same connection to this person, right? And I'm like, Hua Chong's like, why are you scared? And he's like, when I see him, I want to run away as far as possible. So yeah, the mountain spirits running is amazing. I, I just imagine it being like Rainbow Road and it's like a rainbow light speed thing where they're going so fast the rainbows are moving all around them. I just imagine that's what's happening with the mountains running. And I just, I want, I want to see so much of this animated so badly and we're going to have to wait like 20 years <laughs> before it happens. But I'm like, damn it, come on now. So all the landscapes are moving really, really quickly. I'm glad that Pei Ming and the others show up. I'm glad we didn't have to go look for them because that was that was what I was afraid of. I was afraid that we were going to have to go looking for them. It was going to be a quest. We were going to have to dig through this mountain spirit and they were going to notice. I'm glad that it's not the case and everybody shows up, right? And so this is where Shi Lian talks about what the Goshi said in two days. And he's like, let me, let me theorize and, and show you my, like, Shilian pulls out his own whiteboard coon conspiracy board. And he's like, okay, listen up, Hua Chong, here's the thing. So yeah, he talks about how the Goshi of Shanla could be the missing mountain. He's like, do you think it's a coincidence? And Hua Chong is like, well, look, I mean, it maybe it just so happens that there's four all together. He's like, you know, there's four famous tales, four famous calamities, you know, one had to be, there weren't four famous calamities, so somebody had to be forced in, so to make it four, so I mean, could be coincidence, right? He doesn't dissuade it. Also, that reminds me that I'm going to add one more down here, and that is the princess tale. We still don't have the princess tale answered. That's the one tale we don't have answered, so we're going to find all that. We still don't know anything about where where Chi Rong is, we don't know them, where they're at right now. Um, the Feet of Spirit, we don't know where they're at right now. Um, all that jazz. But he says it could just be coincidence. 
And Shelian's like, well, but if it's true that I had four masters who are the four guardians, why did they come to the go to Shanla to become the Goshi of Shanla? Why did they come to teach me? Is there something about me I wasn't aware of? Could it be that I'm actually, and what he was going to say is the crown prince of Wuyang. He's like, was I the crown prince of Wuyang that was like reincarnated? Is that it? And Hua Chong says, it's not possible. I swear you are you. You are not anyone else. Trust me. Don't read too much into things and imagine what's not there. I feel like Hua Chong is trying not to spoil him. <laughs> you know? But here's the thing too. Hua Chong, I feel like with Hua Chong, it could be the fact that if Xilin is the reincarnated Prince of Wuyang, that Hua Chong's trying to tell him, he's like, look, even if you're reincarnated and you have the ability to ascend like that prince did, because there are a lot of similarities between what the prince does and what Shi Lian does. There's a lot of similarities there. The prince basically wanted to save his people, only it's in reverse. We're going to talk about that when we get to the murals. It's almost in reverse, right? But Hua Chong is like, whatever happens, he's like, even if you were this vessel, even if you were the reincarnation of a prince, you are not that prince. You are yourself. You are your own individual person. Don't let this be a matter of fate and destiny and prophecy. He's like, that's not how this works. He's like, don't do that. Don't fall into that trap. My thing is, what if, what if that's not the case? What if, because when they say the crown prince, they don't say the crown prince of Shanla. They just say the crown prince. They don't say the crown prince of Wuyang. They don't specify, right? What if Hua Chong is the reincarnated prince? What if it was him? What if he was the reincarnated prince? And the reason I say that is because of the ominous star. The ominous star. There, there's two ways I think you can look at this. One could, and I find this toy and throw it before my dog goes absolutely crazy. There it is. Aha. One thing is, there's two ways you can look at it. Could Hua Chong be the reincarnated prince? And the whole time, maybe the Goshi thought they were looking for Shi Lian and thought Shi Lian was the reincarnated prince and it was Hua Chong the entire time. And Hua Chong was the one. He was just born in this awful circumstance and that's what ended up happening. Who knows? Or maybe it is Shi Lian is the reincarnated prince and the ominous star. What if this, like, what if they're two beings? What if the ominous star and the crown prince are was one being that split into two and they've always been meant to be together? It's fate. What if that's the case? What if the original crown prince of Wuyang was reborn into two different people? Reborn into the crown prince of Shanla and the kid under the ominous star? That could be something interesting and it's just like fate putting Hua Chong and Xilin together. They were meant to be the entire time. And if they come together, it'll like awaken whatever between the two of them and they can either destroy or save the world. Who knows? But I feel like the ominous star thing is important because when the Goshi found San Long and saw that he had the ominous star, he wanted him out immediately. He was like, nope, get out. No, 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 no. So maybe, I mean, the two ways you can look at it is if Hua Chong was the reincarnation of the crown prince, Maybe the Goshi was like, oh, you're actually the one we're looking for, but you're born under the Amun Star. Mm -mm. Nope, we tried that once before. We had that guy be our crown prince before. Now we can use Shi Lian. Shi Lian's different than you. He can be what the former crown prince of Wuyang was not. We're going to worship him now instead and put him on the pedestal. We need to get you out of here so that you don't mess things up like Wuyang was messed up. Maybe. Or it could be the thing where they found, like before, the stars aligned in Wuyang where the ominous star and the heart constellation, they combined and it was disastrous. And maybe this time the Goshi of Shanla were like, look, we found the vessel that is the reincarnated Prince of Wuyang. He doesn't have the ominous star around him anymore. So everything's gonna be all hunky dory. And when do things start going wrong? When Xilin meets Hua Chong. So, or at least wrong for Shanla. And the Goshi noticed that. So maybe they were like, maybe at one point, the Prince of Wuyang was with the ominous star and it was this disaster combination. But then the Goshi of Shanla find Shi Lian. They're like, oh, you could be our king like before. We can make Shanla the new Wuyang, but we don't have to worry about the ominous star anymore. Everything's gonna be, everything's going so well. And then Hua Chong shows up and they're like, no, this is the ominous star we were missing 
that we had back at Wuyang. We don't want that anymore. And then things go crazy. I don't know, right? I don't know. I just, I feel like it's all connected. Everything's connected, but we don't exactly know how. Shilian's throwing out all these theories and Huachong's like, whoa, calm down. We don't, don't, let's not determine anything until we know the truth. So I feel like there's some truth with all of this, but there's clearly some stuff MXCX is going to throw us a curveball with that we aren't ready for yet. <laughs> so we can't say this is factual, but we're getting there. I feel better. I, I feel like now... I do think the Goshi, the Mountain Spirits, and the Goshi of Shanla are the four. I think they are, for sure. What they want to do with Shilian, I have no idea. Why they're taking him to the kiln, that doesn't make sense to me yet. And how Bai Wu Shang and Shilian and Wachong are all connected from Wuyang to Shanla, I don't know. But there's connections there, and I feel like we're going to find out soon. <laughs> Or by the time we get to volume six and seven, maybe that's what we find out. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. I don't know. So, but Hua Chong is just all about Xilin not reading too much into it. He's like, don't get obsessed with the past. And I think a big part of that is that Hua Chong knows that Xilin has been so hurt by his past. He's like, let's not focus about the past anymore. Remember how much pain and heartbreak that brings you? Let's not go there. Let's just focus on now and the future, right? I feel like if, if Hua Chong gets a hold of this Goshi of Shanla, we're going to have problems. Because I feel like Hua Chong is like, why are you making my gege think these things? Stop. Okay. He's like, you're not anyone else. I can swear that you are. You are you. You're not anyone else. Trust me. And that's the thing. Like, Hua Chong said he's the most sincerest, but can we really believe him? That's the question. And so he asked what the Goshi's background is, right? And he doesn't really remember. He says the Goshi was the Goshi before I was born, which is a little bit suspect, right? I only know he was called Mei Nyanqing, but that could have been a fake name, probably. He's like, why didn't he ascend? If it was just him now, then he could have been really, really low. So he could have been a ghost. He could have been a ghost this whole time, right? And just passing off if he hadn't. Hmm. And then Hua Chong is like, well, we're going to take care of things as they come. And then I love this. I love that Hua Chong says, if anything should happen, I'm here. I'm always going to be on your side. There were several moments in this. I was like, that is like the sweetest thing that Hua Chong says. I think Hua Chong wants him to know. He's like, don't, don't lose me. I don't want to lose you again, you know? And so then they're like, well, how do we find the others? And so then they all just show up. General Payne, everybody just, they don't have to go looking for him. It's great. And they all figure out what's going on. And I love General Pei just playing with the Daruma doll like, like he's a dang cat, right? And so then Shilian starts to, starts to pass out going to sleep. I love this scene because Shilian is trying his hardest to like catch, catch a nap. And Hua Chong just kind of like, he slides over Shilian. He's like, okay, you can put your head on my, my shoulder as a pillow. And then everybody's being loud and Hua Chong is like, can you all shut up? <laughs> and then Hua Chong is like, I finally get a chance to have Gege sleeping on my arm, and you guys are just goofing around. He's like, wait till we get to Mount Tonglu. And that is the thing. Going straight to Mount Tonglu sounds like a great idea. Sounds like a wonderful idea. We're just cutting our corners. We're heading straight there. No more messing about. Wonderful times. But I'm like, this could be really dangerous for Pei Su, for Ban Yu, for Pei Ming, for all the people involved. And Hua Chong's like, I don't care. <laughs> Chong's like, I don't care about you plebeians. I just got to keep my prince safe. That's all. I just got to keep my gege safe. That's it. It's great. And so then Pei Ming passes out or Pei Su passes out. And Pei Ming's like, why is this? And it's like, because he's mortal. And this part gets me. The part that where we can't go a volume without Shilian bringing up his past sufferings. Can't do it. I, I was doing good until Shilian's like, oh, well, you know, I've had extensive experience with starvation and being beaten. And I'm like, oh no. He's like, you know, one meal can sustain you for three days and you can take 10 beatings without it meaning anything. And you know, Hua Chong is just like, I don't want to hear about this. Like, it's just so sad because Shilian suffered so much. And I fear that Hua Chong is going to get really mad at these mountain spirits and really mad at the Goshi because he's like, you're making my gay gay worry about stuff that he shouldn't have to worry about anymore. You're, you're bringing back past pain that I thought we were over, thought we were through all this, and now you're bringing back all this past trauma. How about we stop, you know? And also, how did Banyu still have the top 
old Phoenix is. How did she still have that pot of food? And Pei Ming's like, get that out of here. I don't blame him for that. I'm like, no, that stuff is disgusting. Why are we doing this? <laughs> what is happening? And then Hua Chong's like, see, they're noisy and rowdy. Just, just, just take another nap. It's fine. We'll, we'll be there soon, right? <laughs> we'll be in the mountain soon. Okay. But then Yin Yu is like, we've gone close to a, a 800 miles is how long we've traveled. And Shilian's like, well, I just want to take a look at everything. This part was freaking terrifying. Freaking terrifying. The idea, again, that the plains and valleys and landscapes of Wuyang make an optical illusion of a giant face smiling. Nope. <laughs> I instantly thought of Bai Wusheng's mask. I thought, for instance, it was like the mask with the smile on one side and the frown on the other. Again, I feel Bai Wusheng is connected to all this. I feel that everything is connected with Bai Wusheng and, and Wu Yang. I don't know how, but the fact of, but it also points to the fact that there is this smiling face, this smiling face of Wu Yang. It points that it's something like heavenly. It's something kind of ethereal that there's like this maybe deity connected to the whole city. It's really crazy. And Matt Tong moves at the center of it. So I don't know. I don't know what we do with that. Could it be that Mount Tonglu was created to like, there were too many people brought in, there were too many people brought to the heavenly court. And so they had to get kicked out and they were kicked in, into the kiln. I, but it seems like the kiln was activated and that's why they all left. The mountain erupted. So I'm like, again, if we look at the whole Bai Wusheng as the, Bai Wusheng as the, the villain in this, did Bai Wusheng cause the eruption to happen and cause Shi Lian to have to choose again. Is Bai Wusheng just this creature that just tests people, right? Did it test the prince of Wuyang at the time being like, well, why don't you just take all the people up to the heavenly realm if you want to escape my eruption? And that's what the prince did. And then the human face disease comes around and Bai Wusheng's like, well, I know how you can fix it. You know, like I, it just feels like the devil incarnate and I don't know what to do with that, but yeah. So they go down to the nose. I love it's the nose because it's like, who knows? The nose knows the secrets, right? It's so good. But I love that Pei Ming and all them, I love they use Ruhi. I was really worried and am still worried they're not going to get back to the mountain, but I guess they will because Ruhi is tied on. Who knows? Who knows how that works? And so then they all decide to go. Pei Ming decides to bring Pei Su because he's going to take him to go get water so he can live. <laughs> And while they're there, right before they leave, he goes, what's that on your hands? I feel like Pei Ming is constantly there to bring up shipper fodder, being like, hey, you've got, you've got a string around your hand. What is it? What is it? You know? And then that's when they explain that, oh, it's a, a spiritual thing of contact. And Pei Ming is like, well, well that's convenient. Nice. But what if, it, what if you trip over it? And so then Hua Chong's like, well, we'll just make it more practical. I like that they still have the, the threads tied around their fingers. I like that. But I also like that it's now an invisible wire between them. I, I think that's really good. My fear and what's going to break my heart is at some point in these stupid books, if we get to like volume seven and suddenly she looks down at his hand and the string is gone, I'm going to freaking cry. I'm like, nope, don't do that. Don't. They're setting it up. They're setting up as long as they're safe, they'll see the string. But if it disappears, then somebody's not safe. And I'm waiting for it to happen and I'm going to be an emotional wreck. <laughs> No, that's where I'm going to be, right? That's where I'm going to be. And so now they jump down and go to the temple and go through the dark hole and everything. I, I like the Pompeii aspect of the city. I like the city is like Pompeii where everyone was like buried alive through the ash and everything. The, the corpse rats are creepy. The idea that these rats like burrowed into the statues and sucked out like the, the fluids from the corpses is mildly disturbing. <laughs> I'm like, MXTX, how could you do this? How could you do this to us, right? Because yeah, I watch, um, there's a woman, it's called Ask a Mortician. Uh, her name is like Caitlin Dowdery. I've read a couple of her books. She's a mortician. And she talks about like, like different processes of dying and cremation and stuff like that. Um, and she does videos on YouTube about her stuff. She's really fascinating. But if you have a, like a morbid deep dive you wanna do sometime, but this seems like the way that the statues describe like the body's liquefying is like the process of being inside like a crypt or a mausoleum or something like that. But the fact that like a rat gets in there, I was really honestly waiting for Shelian to have like a melancholy moment because 
when Hua Chong, when they go to grab, when Hua Chong, like, takes the, the statue and it crumbles into shards, I thought Shilian was going to think back to when Shi Rong and Guzi get in the tomb and, like, cause his mother's body to collapse. I thought he was going to have, like, a moment of reflection on that, but that's not what ends up happening. So I kept waiting for that to happen, but we don't give it. But in any case, the volcano Mount Tongwu erupting means that the prophecy that the crown prince of Wuyang saw came true. And that's proof of it. So they go down and find the mural, right? And before they find the mural, I like that Hua Chong says, like, I need to ask you something. He's like, I know you can't die and you're not afraid to die, but no matter how tough you are, don't think you're incapable of getting hurt. And I love that. Like, Hua Chong's like, the thing I don't want to see is for you to be hurt. He's like, I don't like seeing you in pain. He's like, I love you. I worship the ground you walk on. He's like, the last thing I want you to do is suffer because you've suffered enough. And so he's like, just please don't do anything stupid that will get you hurt. That's all I ask. And I like that Shi Lian like kind of smiles despite himself. He's like, okay. Like it's just this really, there's these really sweet smiles between the two of them. It's very sweet. Like they're, they're, they're just like looking at each other like longingly in each other's eyes. And Shi Lian's like, well then if that's the case for me, then you don't do it either. You be safe too. And I love that Hua Chong's like, okay. It's just like, it's the sweetest thing. It's so cute. It's like them, it's just like them, them admitting that they like, they care for each other. They haven't admitted that they like each other yet because it's the slowest slow burn in the history of romance. But they're admitting that they both care about each other and like, hey, I'll watch out for you if you watch out for me. It's so sweet. It's the cutest thing. And that's when we see the the bodies like the, the fact that the servants like going to the well and got buried that way is really creepy but then them like holding like the couple holding the baby in between them and so then there are the protection charms the protection charms that are the ominous star so the idea of these two things this like ruin and destruction omen meeting with the emperor and all this so yeah again there, I think there's three things. I think that there's honestly, there are three ways we could look at this. And I think that it's all, again, we're not doing the rule of four. We're going to do the rule of three, right? We're going to do this. Where we have either, as far as we know, either Shi Lian is the prince. Either Shi Lian is the prince. He's the god of misfortune. Maybe that's where this, maybe the prince of Wuyang is the original god of misfortune. And that's what happens, right? I, I feel like maybe that could be it, that he's the prince that was born under the ominous star. And then maybe that's it. Maybe that is it. Maybe Hua Chong, even though Hua Chong was born under the ominous star, maybe Shi Lian was already there and they just attract each other. Maybe that was it. Maybe Shi Lian had bad luck from the start and it just took meeting Hua Chong to activate it. Maybe. Or it could be that Hua Chong is the prince and he was reborn under the ominous star again. Or it's Bai Wu Shang. Bai Wu Shang is the ominous star the first time, and now Hua Chong is the ominous star the second time. If we find out that Hashan was born under an ominous star, then it's settled. Then it's just like boom, 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 right? And Chi Rong just wishes he was born under an ominous star so he could be a scream ghost. <laughs> but yeah, one of these three are the prince. I think it's either Xilian, Hua Chong, or Bai Wu Shang is the prince of Wu Yang. One of those three. We just don't know which one yet, and we don't know why the ghost she want to get all of them together. Or at least Hua Chong and Shi Lian together at Mount Tonglu. We don't know that yet. Who knows? Who knows? We're not, we're not there yet, right? And so Hua Chong talks about how he learned. And here's the thing too. I, again, uh, one thing that could feed the idea that Hua Chong is the prince of Wuyang is the fact that he can read Wuyang. I know he gave Shi Lian that big old story about learning it. Like he was, uh, was a self-taught Rosetta Stone. I know that he, he says that. But honestly... Okay, here's the thing. I, that is something to think about, too. What if Hua Chong is the prince of Wu Yang and, like, all of the memories of Wu Yang and everything came back after he died? Like, after he became a ghost, he realized everything. Like, when he went to Mount Tonglu as a ghost, he saw everything and all the memories came back. He remembered who he was. He remembered what happened when he was a prince. What if he had been the prince of Wu Yang? And had tried to save all those people and cared so much about everyone like Shi Lian cared. And then suddenly it all fell to hell in a handbasket 
and he was sent down and destroyed and then he was reborn as Hua Chong that we know as Hong. He was reborn as Hong. And then he met Shi Lian, who reminded him so much of himself when he was the prince. And they saw all the hardships that Shi Lian went through, like he had gone through as the prince. And then he decided to become a supreme ghost and go after him. Because he didn't want... He, he had been alone all that time, and he didn't want Shi Lian to be alone either. I don't know. I mean, maybe that could be it. That would explain why Hua Chong would know the language of Wu Yang or learned it so quickly. It would explain why he had this like ability to learn all the things about the heavenly realm and all the backstory because he, in a former life, had had all this experience as the prince and had been ascended. It would explain why he doesn't care about anybody else now because he saw what that got him when he was the prince of Wu Yang and now he's like, well, screw that. I'm just going to protect Shi and the one person I care about. I don't know. No, I just, I feel like we're down to these three options. It's either Shi Lian's the prince, Hua Chong is the prince, or Bai Wu Shang is. Or they're all connected. <laughs> but we don't know yet, right? It fell from over 2,000 years ago and there aren't any descendants left. So how could you learn? And he explains how he did it. And that's when we get the rats, right? And the rats coming in the jar. So we, we see the three murals, right? The rats, that means there's water nearby. So they crowd around the first mural. And so I do agree with the interpretation that they find out that there is a way to escape the eruption and that's to expand our territory. But the crown prince is like, I don't want to do that. It seems like the polar opposite of what happens with Shanla, because with this, they're suggesting that Wu Yang tried to expand out and move its people out away from the volcano. And it started having these battles with the other countries. And the prince was like, this isn't any good. Which is kind of the opposite. Instead, instead of them expanding out during Shanla, the people of Yongin and everywhere else came to Shanla and it caused the battle because they wanted to keep the people in and not have to worry about the immigrants. So it seems like the polar opposite situation happened between the two and it just escalated. And instead of the mural of the crown prince of Wu Yong being like, let's not get involved, Shi Lian was like, no, I'm going to get involved. So... Then we cut to the second one where there's all of like blood flowing like rivers. There's a battlefield. There's soldiers on both sides being killed. You can tell which ones are Yang because of their armor. They look savage and they're enjoying the battle and they're even attacking women and children. And so above within the thick clouds, there's a silver white light where the Prince of Yang peeked half his body from the clouds to watch the scene below his expression angry. And one of his arms was extended and he reached released many pillars of golden light and the soldiers were sucked up into the light. Meaning he decided to stop the soldiers. He decided to stop the battle from above because he didn't like what was happening. And so it, what's interesting is that Pei Ming is like, well, that's touching, but if one of the kingdoms have to perish, then choosing to protect your own can't be helped. He's like, the soldiers charging the front lines, if they hadn't been cut down by the enemies, they would have died from the range of their own crown prince. I wouldn't want to fight for a king like that. Hmm. And then, you know, there's the question that Shi Lian's like, well, you know, I wasn't exactly a good commander of my people either, so can relate, right? Can relate. So, yeah, but I like the general pay, which is funny because he ended up fighting his own men. There's a little bit of irony there. But Hua Chong only grunted coldly. So, yeah, so Shi Lian's like, I guess that's true, but, but Hua Chong only grunted coldly. So, like, you don't know what you're talking about. So, again... Could Hua Chong be the crown prince? Uh, we, we don't know. Is that why Hua Chong is so adamant about saying, no, you are you, Shi Lian. You're not the crown prince. And he doesn't want to say, it's me. You know? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe they're trying to get rid of the crown. Maybe they're trying to get rid of... Sh Maybe the Goshi and all them are trying to get rid of Hua Chong, the ominous star, so that he can't harm Shi Lian or anybody else again. I don't know. Maybe they're like, Shi Lian can't be saved. He's too attached to Hua Chong. We can't save him. So we're just going to destroy Hua Chong. And if he has to be there, he has to be there. Maybe. I don't know. And so then they looked to the third one. They built a bridge that connected the heaven and the earth with the intention to bring his people over. And I like that Shi Lian was just like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Part of me is like, was he thinking back to Sean Lee being like, why didn't I think of that? I could have done that. You know, what, what, what could have? And so he's like, he can do that. And Hua Chong says, why not? 
he isn't appointing generals, just bringing mortals to the realm. Why can't he do it? And Peyton is like, quit making it sound so easy. Appointing general takes spiritual power. This is how many he's appointing. Judging by the relics left behind, Wuyang's only 100,000 in population, which is a lot smaller than Shanla. Um, so the vicinity of the royal capital is probably about 10,000. It would be tough, but it's doable, but just barely. So that could be it. That could be why... That could be why Hua Chong has all this energy, not only because of his love for Shi Lian, but because he's the reincarnated prince. He has all this energy that just keeps getting reincarnated over and over again. But yeah, what if Hua Ch Either, what if one of these three used up all of their energy to bring the people to the heavenly court and then was just reborn back on Earth or ended up becoming immortal and had to leave the realm and left all the people up there? What if that was the case? But what if tragedy struck and bringing all those people to heavenly court what if it led to the court being completely wiped out right before june Wu's generation shows up that could be something too right i don't know <laughs> but there's so much to think about my brain my brain is like mush right and so there's no one like him in history there's no other like him in history that could be done either extreme courage or stupidity i mean it if anybody is to be extreme stupidity or extreme courage, Shi Lian could fit the bill on that, I guess. But, and then he says, the, he says the deputies looked more and more peculiar, more and more like his own face in the faces of the Goshi. He recalled the celestial phase of the ominous star. This story that was so much like a tale of reincarnation made him eager to learn what happened next. But he felt he perhaps already knew. So yeah, it could be that Shi Lian's just been reincarnated and that he was the Prince of Wuyang and he was reborn and they were trying to just prevent the same thing happening that happened before, but then it did. So, but then why act now? What's the point? I don't know. And so there they are. So they go on there trying to find the water and that's when he hears, that's when he hears the voices saying, it's so hot. Your Highness, where are you? Save me, save me. And it's, for a second I thought, I was like, did the humans from this place turn into rats? Did they become ghosts and in ghost form they look like rats? Is that it? Were they like, but no, they're corpse rats. They're rats who have ate the corpses and they have the spirits inside of them, right? The spirits of those people or their memories inside of them, which is creepy, right? They're all corpse eating rats. And so he says, he's like, oh, he said the rats ate the corpse bodies and those emotions were eaten too. So they could start speaking the human tongue, expressing what those people had wanted to say at the moment of their death, but couldn't. Which is terrifying, right? It, it feels kind of like the human face disease a little bit, where the people of Yongin are screaming, only it's like the boils instead of the rats, right? It's very similar. And so he says, I wondered why they would say such words. And he's like, what did you say? What did you hear? And he's like, oh, didn't you hear Song Long? And he's like, how could he understand the Wu Yong tongue? So either, either Shi Lian knows Wu Yong and can understand the words, but he can't read it. Which again, if we're looking at Shi Lian and Hua Chong being together, then both being like the two halves that equaled the Prince of Wu Yong originally, you have one can read, one can say, one can hear the language, one can read it. I mean, ah, <laughs> but I don't know. MXTX is known for these stupid cliffhangers that make you think one thing. And then in the next set of chapters, it's completely proven wrong. And you're like, and you were like, <laughs> right? So I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to go on the bandwagon and go all in at the poker table and say, yes, Shi Lian is the former Prince of Wuyang. I feel like that is the, that seems the most obvious right now, but MXTX always throws in that curveball that even if it's partially true, it's not entirely true. So MXTX has got some more curves to throw at us, but I'm definitely convinced that Bai Wu Shang, Hua Chong, and Shi Lian are all connected with Wu Yang somehow. I am fully convinced. I just don't know how. So yeah, I'm not gonna wait. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I may wait for the end of this volume. I may wait for the other chapter of the Manhua to come out so I can look at it and be on track with the Manhua and the volumes, but I'm not going to wait to this next set of chapters. I'm going to wait a little bit, maybe a couple days, maybe a couple days. 
um, you know, get some comments in for the next set that you all will see, and I'll talk about them, but I'm not going to wait too long. <laughs> Because I want to know. Now we're getting to the nitty gritty. We're almost in this volume. My fear is that we're going to leave on this, not touch on it, and then we'll have to wait to volume six before we touch back on it. That seems likely. <laughs> but y'all, I'm so excited. I, I really want to know your comments down below what you all thought of these chapters, but I'm just floored. I'm I want I'm like Sheila Ann. I want to know the truth, and I feel like Kwa Chong is like I don't think we can handle the truth, and I'm like just tell it to me. So, but but don't spoil me. <laughs> Please no spoilers, or clues. But I'm excited to hear your comments down below. Oh my God. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. I'm gonna erase everything except the green, and then we'll come back next week and talk more about heaven officials blessing. Bye.